myself chandrakant kumar on behalf of ieee bangalore section and connect 2020 organizing committee extend a very warm welcome to all the dignitaries and participants connect is a flagship conference of ieee bangalore section and it started in uh, 2014 2014 and uh, connect 2020 is the sixth edition of it initially it was designed to be a, a different conference and that i leave it to the general chair and tpc chair to talk about but someone had altogether a different idea that led us to here that is in the virtual mode probably this is the first such big conference being held in virtual mode in india the safety of each of the each and every participants is of our paramount importance so we do not encourage more than one person joining from a single system simultaneously unless they are from the same family. In case of uh, situation compels, please ensure that, ensure that adequate precautions are taken. Ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has thrown up a challenge to each one of us. But you yourself will find in these three days that Bangalore section and the organizing committee has taken this challenge and convert it into a opportunity in true sense. I also have a special mention of ANSYS, the platinum sponsor and the Interpol, the annual sponsor of us, for their support even in that difficult time. So with this small prologue, I invite our ever enthusiastic Mr. Punit Kumar Mistra, General Chair Connect 2020 and Chair of Bangalore Section of IEEE, and probably who doesn't need, need any further introduction to all the uh, uh, people joined us together, join us now. So I request him to deliver the address as a general chair and formally welcome the area of dignitaries and participants present for this uh, occasion. Thank you. Dr. Chandrakanta, hope I'm audible. Yeah, you are loud and clear. Thank you. So friends, we are extremely honored to have Ms. Susan Cathy Land, IEEE President-Elect, Mr. Deepak Mathur, IEEE Regent and Director-Elect, Professor S.N. Singh, IEEE India Council Chair, Dr. Suresh Nair, Chair-Elect IEEE India Council, Dr. K. Ramakrishna, past IEEE Art and Director and past Chair of IEEE Bangalore Section as our guest of honor. We are also honored to have Professor Akinori Nishihara, IEEE Regent and Director as Chief Guest. On behalf of IEEE Bangalore Section, Connect Organizing Committee, and on my own behalf, I welcome you all to this first virtual Connect of IEEE Bangalore Section. I would also like to welcome all the past chairs of Bangalore Section, members of India Council and Bangalore Section Execom, chairs of different IEEE sections of India, speakers and delegates of IEEE Connect who have joined us virtually through WebEx as well as Facebook Live. It is a great pleasure to welcome you all to the IEEE International Conference on Electronics, Computing and Communication Technologies, namely IEEE Connect. Connect is the flagship conference of IEEE Bangalore section. This conference provides an opportunity for academic researchers, students, practicing engineers and industry experts to interact and exchange ideas on topics relevant to the current trends in various technologies of electronics, computing, and communication. Experts from India, USA, Europe, and South Asian countries are attending Connect 2020. As per the initial plan, this conference was supposed to happen at Geetham University, Bangalore. However, Due to COVID-19 pandemic, we were forced to convert this into a virtual conference. This conference received a large number of submissions and the TPC has done a good job by selecting very, after rigorous review of each paper by at least three reviewers, a good collection of papers that will be presented during the conference in 42 technical sessions. The conference also has invited eminent speakers for keynote, invited talks, workshop, and tutorials, who will share the excitement of their new findings. 
focus of the conference is expanded this year by inviting various chapters of Bangalore section to own and manage one track each. We are extremely happy to share that AESS, APMTT, CAS, CIS, COMSOC, Nanotechnology, Photonics, CELS, IES, SPS, RAS, and VTS have joined our hands to make Connect 2020 a huge success. This year, we have also introduced four special tracks on aerospace electronics, high power millimeter wave sources and light components, space technology, and women in engineering with an aim to provide the latest information on future technologies and encourage participants to develop technologies for the benefit of humanity. We are pleased that close to 900 participants have registered for this conference and they will share their work and participate in this virtual conference. The conference has been made possible due to the generous support of our sponsors, Anesis, Intuit Technologies, and IEEE HSE. We sincerely thank all of them for their invaluable support during this, even this pandemic situation that is more important. They have not left us in between. Few of them already told that there is a problem, so they cannot continue, but we are thankful to them. Also, it would not be possible to organize a conference of such a magnitude without the help of uh, some committed individuals. Connect is particularly indebted to the steering committee, international advisory committee, TPC, reviewers, finance, publicity, publication, sponsorship, web, and other volunteers. We convey our gratitude to the eminent keynote, invited, and workshop speakers. We hope all the participants will have a wonderful time in this virtual conference where each one will be technically enriched. I'm sure that it will happen. Please make time to attend our cultural program as well, which is planned on tomorrow, July 3rd from 8 p.m. onwards. Thank you. Dr. Chandrakanta, we can go to the next. Uh, thank you very much, Puneet for your uh, nice introduction and uh, give a brief overview of the full connect and the background of course. Now, uh, Professor B. N. Murlidhar of IIT Bangalore for the last few years leading the technical team and working behind the scene to make this uh, uh, conference connect successful. So without any further delay, I request him to unveil the technical program of connect 2020 in front of the attendee and delegate. Dr. Mulidhara, please. Good evening. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are loud and clear. Please go ahead. Thank you. The 2020 International Conference on Electronic Computing and Communication Technology, namely IEEE Connect, organized by IEEE Bangalore Section during 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of July 2020. This conference is sixth in the series to be organized by IEEE Bank Section. This year, the conference has received research paper submissions in 19 sessions, 19 tracks. Total of 255 peer reviewed papers will be presented in the conference, and these papers will be submitted to IEEE Explorer. The contribution, the contributed papers were selected from a total of 689 submissions. I am grateful to all the program committee members and the track chairs of 19 tracks for the efforts in the review process. I am also thankful to all the reviewers for submitting their valuable reviews in time. Further, I thank all the authors for submitting their papers to 2020 IEEE Connect. Unfortunately, due to ongoing COVID 19 pandemic, holding the conference is Physically is not feasible. So the conference is being organized as a virtual conference. This should not limit the learning that happens during the conference. The conference began with few tutorials and workshops this morning. Apart from the research paper presentations of 255 papers in six parallel sections, 16 keynotes and invited talks have been planned. I request all the participants especially the student participants, to attend as many talks as possible. 
I am especially thankful to all the plenary and invited speakers for the conference. I thank EasyChat, the conference management tool used for submission and the review process. I thank the team led by Mr. Puneet Kumar Mishra, the general chair of the conference and the chair of IEEE Bangalore section, and all the Execom members of IEEE Bangalore section for supporting uh, for supporting this conference in every possible way. I hope you will enjoy the technical program of 2020 IEEE Connect as an informative, inspiring, and a collaborative event. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So there it is. As we promised, a complete engagement for three days. And thank you very much, Professor Murli Dara, for putting it out. And I have been in few sessions in the morning, and actually it was giving the real flavor of the uh, real conference when the people are interacting with uh, the speaker and all. So with that, we hope we'll be having exciting sessions for the next two days also. Now. Let us move forward, and uh, now I go to the next uh, eminent speaker, Professor S. N. Singh, a fellow of IEEE, and maybe does not need any much introduction to the technical fraternities of India. After a brief tenure at IIT Roorkee and few other places in India and abroad, he joined IIT Kanpur, and at present. He is the VC of Madan Mohan Malviya Institute, University of Technology, Gorakhpur, India. He is also the chair of the IEEE India Council. So may I request uh, Professor Singh to kindly share your thought on this occasion, please. Uh, thank you, Chandrakanta. Uh, I'm Adbul. Yeah, you are loud and clear. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, Good evening and good morning, because we are having the people and this connect conference is connecting the world from this east to west, north to south. And uh, no doubt the title of the conference is very good. That's uh, connect, I connect, we connect, you connect, and everyone is connected. So I thank uh, Bangalore section and its organizing team, including Chandrakanta, Murlidhar, Punitji, and many others. Those are volunteers. Those are working day and night to make this event a grand success. Our guests uh, of uh, today's uh, inauguration program, this Ms. Sushan, uh, I can say the three uh, elect people are there. One is the president-elect, the Sushan, the director-elect, uh, Deepak Mathurji, and uh, uh, IC-elect, uh, Nayarji. And of course, uh, myself uh, is the India Council Chair, and the Ramakrishna, the past director. So this other uh, dignitary, those are basically taking part, and I can see the more, more than approximately this, this, this 200 uh, people are looking at here in this many people are just passing the life I believe. So uh, as the name itself is the international sir, you are, and the communication technologies. Sir, we are losing you in between. Can you switch off your video so that link will be better? Yeah, yeah, now it is better, sir. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, because you know what I'm talking about. Why so yeah, so uh, that's okay. Thank you. So uh, this is a conference, uh, Bangalore section. It is a six in series in the row. And uh, day by day, normally they add the new feeders. And this year they have changed in the different, even though you can say I went, from the reality, from the face-to-face, -face, they have now landed to the virtual. And now we have to accept the virtual is a reality, I say in this way. And the virtual conferences are happening across the globe. And a lot of things are uh, good for this virtuality. That's no doubt uh, we are uh, saving our time, saving our money, saving our many, many things. But at the same time, we are losing like our social interactions, our uh, personal interactions, many, many other things are losing. But uh, COVID-19 has basically pushed forward to go for the virtual. And the many, many events are going to be very, very well. Even though yesterday we had one, uh, uh, basically the, we say VCOP, it is a virtual conference organizer panel organized by Bangladesh section. I was the part of one of the speakers. And then here now the different mode of the virtual conferences are happening. One is like this conference, I believe, it is basically the online with the real time. 
means the people will be presenting and other is people are also thinking that uh, and already many conferences are happening that is there uh, online with the recorded and the video and other presentations are there and the many conferences are the mixture of all these things because the internet connectivity and the availability day time day night and time differences many many things are happening so that's why this is already coming and of course we are losing this face to face but the future conferences we are going to have now the virtual plus uh, this hybrid mode we can go for all the modes and now it is basically saving a lot of our energy and other things so this conference is i can see this is a big speakers i was looking at once it was given to me and i just i was browsing how many people are talking in the keynote lectures and i found the enormous number of people are talking in the very very relevant area for the basically need of the hour and that is the basically the main focus no doubt the paper presentation is one part people are presenting the paper and this conference that conference but any conference which is treated as a good quality that the good quality papers good quality the keynote and the presenters and the good quality of organization as well and i believe this conference is meeting in all the aspects in terms of ic there's a keynote speaker or plenary speaker you can see the last number and very very eminent personalities they are speaking and they are not from the india they are basically all across the globe and each of the niche area that they have picked up for their lectures and i'm sure our audience and this conference viewers will be benefited from there so this is a basically the beauty of this event the connect and you know the tag name also we say i triple e there is a connect and we have to be connected this i triple e is a platform where all the people all the elite people those are connected and that is the basically beauty so this i wish this conference and really i thank the organizers especially this general chair punit misra who is the secretary of ic as well and he is very dynamic and is very young and energetic and that's why this i believe this conference is one of the best in india will be the conference yes. treated thank you thank you very much i wish you all the best for the success of this conference thank you thank you, uh, thank you professor singh you have rightly highlighted the real energy behind the conference and as well as the real uh, impact factor of the conference based on which a conference is judged and thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts uh, on this uh, conference and now i uh, will go to dr k ramakrishna so along with his professional accomplishment probably he laid the road for many of us to follow in reaching the global leadership position in ipcc he was the first director of ieee region 10 that is the asia pacific region and he was the first chair of ieee bangalore section and at present he is at the steering committee member uh, of ieee mass smart cities initiative i request dr ramakrishna sir to share a few words on this occasion kindly so dear punit mishra the general chair and this fantastic team the great efforts i congratulate you on this grand gathering and the great inaugural event where all stalwarts are made to come together in fact 10 years ago when i was the bangalore section chair i used to dream oh we should do a lot and we should bring up the section membership to great level Uh, it's about you know that time i remember it was around 6500 of the membership strength of bangalore and later i think the records are broken broken now i think it is probably the largest section in india maybe it must be the third or fifth section in the world bangalore section it's all great efforts of the volunteer leaders who really work very very hard they conduct and conducively they come together they organize effective and efficient leadership programs and great events of technicality i appreciate them a lot in fact when i was the recent director in 2015 16 i have seen that no program is given to bangalore because bangalore is already in the limelight however we did the 50 year celebration inaugural event of ieee region and it was a grand gathering and about 1000 attendees such gathered there and this is the record track record of bangalore section 
and no doubt it is being continued in a great way and they bagged two times the best large section award in the world right triple bangalore section and also during this difficult times of the pandemic i feel that you know uh, what we can do when i before i wrote to the nga being a vice chair for member development how we should approach how we should deal with the uh, virtual reality of engaging members and enriching their value bangalore section has already taken the lead and almost every day every day they conducted one webinar or gather to bring the members together and make them realize what they can contribute what they can really develop in the virtual world hearty congratulations punit it's a great achievement and definitely i think uh, your section becomes a role model and i'm proud to be the bangalore section member and last 27 years i've been there in the section and it, it's a great deal to be part of the bangalore section in fact it has the largest high grade members also in india um, i think around 4000 members and a uh, lot of life uh, life members as well as fellows we have and um, this connect program earlier i think when i was a chair also it used to be bangalore section symposium it used to be named for about 20 years like that and uh, 30 years i think and after that i think couple of years later uh, to connect bring in all chapters together the section leadership thought it is prudent to change the name and bring everyone everybody onto the board and they made this connect and i really appreciate this year's motivation and participation by all the chapters of bangalore section i think around 15 20 chapters they are very actively participating and they contributing in different tracks great speakers are there of various uh, technical field and almost today's uh, panelists uh, all were my colleagues in the board maybe in regenton or the mg or the board at the board i congratulate everyone and you know it's a great honor to be with you all again and uh, i think bangalore section should scale more height and they should become number one in the world that's definitely i'll see that it will happen in the coming years and i wish punith and his great team all the very best to make this conference a grand success and participants it is your inspiration and your enthusiasm that will make us proud always thank you punith and the team thank you all thank you sir uh, thank you sir uh, we can really feel that bangalore section is really is there in your heart and it is coming from there your each and every word is inspiration for all of us and i can feel that all uh, people in bangalore section still talk about you and now i understand why they really talk about you all the time thank you very much sir uh, now uh, we go little beyond uh, this one uh, india let us go to region 10 uh, mr deepak mathur he is one of the few persons whom every i triple volunteer look up to uh, mostly from this part of world because he is the inspiration from our side like uh, dr ram krishna sir to match with his illustrious uh, career spanning over 35 years in the professional field he went, uh, went on to become the art and director elect for 19 uh, 2019 to 20 and he will take over the directorship from uh, 21 to 22 so each one of us probably eagerly waiting uh, to hear uh, from him at this juncture i request uh, mr mathur kindly speak a few words about the conference and as your general feeling thank you chandra kumar chandra kumar ji and you for your generosity for inviting me to this conference. Sir, can you come closer to the mic? It is a little feeble. Uh, is it okay now? Yeah, it, it's fine. Thank you. Go ahead. So, thank you, Chandrakanta Kumar ji. And, and yes, today sir. for your generosity for inviting me to this conference. 
and i remember when the initial discussion on connect 2020 long time back and we were supposed to be in bangalore today for this conference and that for it uh but due to this pandemic uh yes. they have gone virtual in fact all events and conferences after march 2020 have been virtual events if you see the positive side of this current crisis uh the plan events and conferences have been converted to virtual events and because of this more people are able to attend conferences and that too they are participating from the comfort of their own places but no doubt this to this meeting and event Uh, have their own advantages. Probably in future, we will be resorting to a hybrid model. Uh, if I come to Bengal section, Bengal section has always been a very active organization in the IT field. As uh, I just told that uh, uh, it has a very large member base. It ranks third in Asia Pacific region and fifth in IT field. As far as membership strength is concerned, the section and its volunteers. a recipient of many awards and recognitions and the section has received i think most prestigious award two times and that is i think the mgi outstanding national award it is a role model section and such section should provide hand holding and guidance to other sections so that they can elevate their level and enhance with enhanced activities and the organized quality of the section has own innovative way to engage the volunteers and members to variety of programs and events and during this pandemic they have done fantastic job the section has done record number of webinars and it was close to 70 70 webinars and they reached out to 25000 plus members plus participants and this is the first slide of the survey that we have that we are able to invite so many participants to our program And I came to know Connect that Connect 2020 is having more special tracks like uh, aerospace electronics, next generation satellite and space technologies. Connect also has participation from industries, and there are contributed papers from industries, and that is excellent. But there is a need to explore further possibilities of industry opening of partnership and collaboration, and we have to brainstorm how to bring industry academia closer. For mutual benefits, and that is possible through such conferences. We have to have special sessions with leaders of industries to brainstorm on various possibilities of collaborative approach. And this is what I suggest to have in other conferences. And outcome of such discussion should come as an action item for all of us. Our conferences should also address problems of communities. During this pandemic, when we are resorting to virtual and contactless working, probably many of our areas are not ready in terms of technology penetration. Are these conferences will serve as place to discuss our problems and helping in finding solutions? And presently, I think is offering various resources related to present crisis, and which could be used to address issues uh, out of COVID-19 crisis. So let us encourage our members. to know about such resources and use them for their advantage and work towards building new technologies to the plus plus and other solutions so in region 10 uh, i would like to mention this about this special project which is related to bangalore section that in region 10 we are doing a new project for community service and that is a emergency relief program which is to assist victims of national disaster With short-term communications, computer, and power solutions. This is based on well-tested new outreach program of our leaders. So services which we plan to provide include phone charging, internet and communication support, and lighting to disaster victims. And all these systems will be on a truck, and we can drive this truck to the disaster site. When this new truck is not deployed for any disaster, this can be used. It is a very good opportunity for the students and general public in the area of education. And then the section volunteers, the Kerala section volunteers, have taken a new role to implement this program. That will be very satisfying and very engaging, I believe. And we are looking for interested volunteers who would like to be part of this initiative. 
So before I conclude, I would like to continue the final section to for Connect 2020. And I'm sure that Connect 2020 will be able to connect with participants to provide them a value addition. And the conference will serve the set objectives. I wish the conference all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, I can still feel the passion what I uh, felt when I first talked to you over phone and you have nicely laid down the path ahead of us and we can understand when you come to the helm of the affairs in which direction we should move forward and uh, your thoughts on the conference tracks and all these things will definitely keep in your mind and we'll try to implement in our future conferences and thank you very much for sharing your thought now i move uh, to mrs susan kathilan so she is primarily a person dealing with missiles she is in the in this field for more than 30 years and responsible for achieving the command control and battle management and communication systems of it and she is ensuring that no time the target is missed she is also a fellow of IEEE and uh, is also a few months away from, uh, uh, few months away from reaching, the pro reaching probably the topmost target of any IEEE volunteer can think of when joining IEEE, that is the IEEE president. At present, she is uh, IEEE president elect 2020. The organizing committee is very pleased to have you, uh, Madam, uh, amongst us. I request you to kindly address the virtual assembly on this special occasion. Madam, kindly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was the introduction. <laughs> um, it's um, truly my, my pleasure to be here today um, at Connect Connectably as a 2020 president-elect. Um, I can assure you that when I joined IEEE many, many years ago, I, I never envisioned that I would ever be serving in this role, and it's truly an honor. Um, you're um, gathered, uh, you're to be con congratulated today on this gathering, um, the International Conference on Electrics, Computing, and Communication Technologies, or Connect 2020, um, and uh, organized by the Bangalore section. So I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the organizers and sponsors of the conference for all their efforts um, in developing this exciting and important event. Um, what you've been able to accomplish during these challenging times is outstanding. Uh, we've, I can't imagine uh, planning and organizing a conference and then having to pivot uh, with COVID. It's, it's just really been a, a challenging year for everyone, so you're to be commended for your efforts. It's, it's been my privilege throughout my career to know and work with many brilliant and inspiring engineers and technologists. Um, I visited Bangalore. Um, I had the opportunity last year, and I was just very impressed with the men and women that I met um, who strove to, you, to apply their technical talents for the greater good. And um, I have been impressed by the program that I've seen for this event. Um, Engineering as a profession has benefited immeasurably by um, diverse professional societies that have been founded over the years. Um, and this is what unites us as technical professionals and IEEE members in a truly global community defined by a commitment to advancing technology and benefiting humanity through our work. IEEE brings us together not only as engineers, but also as technologists from the fields of computer sciences, information technology, physical science, biological and medical science, mathematics, technical communications, education, management, and law and policy. That's what IEEE's field of interest is. It's very diverse and wide. IEEE societies and local chapters create a culture of inquiry in which similar minds can bring diverse experiences, viewpoints, and perspectives together and bring forth truly wondrous accomplishments. These international communities help facilitate cross-disciplinary collaboration and coordination to advance research and development of technology to help improve the human condition. It's only through the continuous expansion of our fields of interest and the convergence of these fields of interest that we can strive to solve the world's greatest challenges. IEEE technological innovators do share a common desire to learn, collaborate, and give back to their community. 
all are contributing in countless ways to moving technology forward across the spectrum of fields of interest. Together, IEEE can leverage these massive global efforts across government, academia, and industry and focus on developing technologies and maturing them toward commercialization, standardization, and implementation. The initiatives you choose to work on and the problems that you seek to solve are as diverse as the technologies you are using to address those problems. In our world, despite the myriad of advances in technology that the last century has brought with it still needs to be changed for the better. Too many people do not have access to clean water or reliable energy or health care or the internet. Not everyone has had the opportunity to achieve their full potential through access to education. And technology can overcome these tough challenges, it always has, and at no other point in history have we had more opportunities available to us to improve our world. And it's events like Connect that are so very important because we, together we might do what um, IEEE's motto states, that we can advance technology for the benefit of humanity. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to participate and congratulations on what I know will be an amazing event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, uh, for your insightful uh, thoughts. Thank you. And uh, your points are very well taken. And uh, for ensuring the basic needs of the society at large is our responsibility. And that's where we are working towards for a better uh, humanity. And we'll, uh, we'll take uh, these points very seriously in our future activities and endeavors and we'll try to match uh, up to your expectation. And we are also looking forward to working with you very closely in the coming year. Thank you very much, Madam, on your uh, thought. Now, we come to the moment, uh, and we invite Dr. Akinuri Nishihara, who is a professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, where he has uh, held several academic appointments. Digital signal processing, circuits and systems, and educational technology are the field of his research interest. He is also a fellow of IEEE and at present is the director of the IEEE Region 10, that is the Asia Pacific region. We are honored to have you with us, sir. On behalf of the organizing committee, may I request you kindly address the virtual gathering and declare the conference as open sir kindly okay yeah thank you very much uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome to the international conference on electronics computing and communication technologies or connect to the 2020 conference the host of this conference i could be bangalore section is one of the largest sections in IEEE. Uh, it has 8,822 members as of uh, last year end, which is actually the fifth largest in entire IEEE, uh, following Santa Clara Valley, Beijing, UK and Ireland, and Kerala. So it is the third largest in Region 10 and the second largest in India but uh, the difference between Kerala is only 30, <laughs> very close. Uh, Bangalore section received, as uh, uh, Deepak said, MGA Outstanding Large Section Award in 2019 and 2014. MGA Silver Medal, uh, meeting membership recruitment goal for the year 2018. Region 10 Outstanding Large Section Award in 2013. Region 10 Outstanding Section Award in 2001. From these awards, you can guess how active the section is. And uh, we remember the big celebration of Region 10 Golden Jubilee in August 2016 here in Bangalore. Connect. 2020 attracted uh, nearly uh, 700 papers, but only about 40% of selected papers will be presented. And there are wonderful keynote speakers as you see the program. 
Bangalore is uh, known as a Silicon Valley of India and is loved for its pleasant weather, beautiful parks, and many lakes. It is a pity that uh, we cannot enjoy them as the conference is in virtual mode. A virtual conference has the advantage of easy attendance from anywhere in the world, but the only problem is the time difference. Now, I, I, I do hope all the attendees enjoy this uh, Connect 2020. So I hereby declare the op official opening of Connect 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for your insightful uh, thought and, uh, glorif and glorifying facts of the Bangalore section you have put into the uh, records. So thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, now the conference is open and I can see in the panel many eminent personalities of Bangalore section and past chair of region 10 and all these people, they have joined us. Uh, for want of time, we could not give him, give all of them some opportunity to, to speak in this uh, occasion, but we'll definitely, we'll like to listen to you in a different uh, uh, gatherings. Of course, you are always the uh, inspiration for all of us. Now, uh, I request uh, Dr. B.S. Bindu Madhava, who is a senior scientist and a senior director at the Center for Advanced Computing, CDAC, as popularly known in India. He is an accomplished technocrat and at present the chair elect of Bangalore section. I request him uh, to propose the vote of thanks to the virtual, to this virtual assembly. Dr. Bindu Madhav, sir, please. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Shantakan. Uh, it is an, uh, indeed a uh, privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this uh, auspicious day, what we call uh, the inauguration happening for the first time in the evening. Uh, so that is also first time. So everything happens to be a first time uh, and uh, they connect to the 2020. Uh, this is our flag flagship conference. So uh, one of the uh, flagship conference. So I would like to thank uh, uh, Susan Cathy Land uh, the IEEE pre president elect 2020 for delivering the special address. And I would like to thank uh, uh, Deepak Mathur, IEEE R10 director elect for delivering the special address. I would like to thank um, SN Singh, who is uh, the chairperson IEEE India Council to deliver the special address. And uh, I would like to thank uh, K. Ramakrishna, past art and director, past chair, Bangalore section to deliver this special address. A special thanks to Akinori Nishahari, uh, IEEE art and director who is in uh, the seat to deliver the uh, inaugural address and aptly give the position at which we are. A reminder saying that we are in second position. So we will try to sort of uh, make sure that we get that uh, on the top. So with that inspiration thing, I would like to thank, uh, a special thanks to him. I would like to thank all the speakers who are the eminent uh, speakers whom we have lined up. I would like to thank all the track uh, chairs. And this conference uh, virtually or physically cannot happen without the authors. So we would like to thank uh, the authors for uh, sort of uh, giving us so many, submitting so many papers. And uh, we would like to thank uh, the platinum sponsor, ANSYS, and our annual sponsor, IEEE, IEEE HAC. All the committee members, uh, because uh, without having, having 15 tracks uh, is not a joke. So having uh, a track chair itself, 15 track chairs is another problem. So I would like to thank all the volunteers who have volunteered to be in the track chairs. And uh, I would like to thank all the past chairs of the Bangalore section who have assembled and uh, are there to grace this uh, with uh, valuable suggestions also. 
I would like to thank all the chairs of uh, the IEEE sections in India for their guidance. Of course, uh, uh, the main guidance is from uh, Prasen Singh, who has happened to be the chairman for the IEEE India Council. And I would like to thank our Exicom members who have uh, toiled day and day out to make this happen. So we were uh, just debating one month back what to do. So this is uh, really uh, virtually also we are able to make this in a grander way. So I would like to thank all our volunteers who are directly and indirectly involved. And I would also like to thank all the Exicom members of the India Council also for uh, mentoring us. Uh, and uh, I would like, uh, I mean, we would also like to thank all the staff members of IEEE India office who had uh, given the support. So with this particular thing, I would like to sort of uh, end saying that there is a good technical feast also added with some culture, cultural programs uh, for the next three days organized by us. Uh, we make sure that you get the best uh, for the return on investment, whatever is there. Thanks for all. If I missed anybody, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So before we close this session, I would like to invite all of you to switch on your uh, videos. All the panelists, please switch on your videos so that we can have one photo session. At least we cannot have full photo session of all the attendees, but at least panelists, we can have one photo session. So please switch on your video. Can you have that nice cover that was coming in the background? Uh, if I will put that cover, then we cannot have this video. So that's okay. why I have removed that. Yeah. So I request all of you to please switch on your video. I know some of you may be having lesser bandwidth. It may be difficult, but at least uh, those who are having bandwidth, please switch on. Yes, sir, can you switch on? Yes. Das, sir, yes. Hari, sir? Dr. Murli Dhara? I am here. Uh, I am outside, so I have to wear a mask. So. <laughs> okay. okay. That will be a good message for all of us to wear masks. Yes, very good. Yeah. Sudhindra, sir, can you switch on the video? So I can see Krishna, sir, yeah. Okay, whoever is there now, we will take because otherwise it is going and coming. Thank you. Yeah, over to you, Dr. Uh Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bidnumanda, for the uh, proposing the vote of thanks and uh, uh, Mr. Punit Mishra for your con nice uh, arrangement for taking the photograph. So with this, we come to the conclusion of the opening ceremony. The keynotes uh, addresses for the are lined up for the participants immediately after this uh, session. Wishing you all the best for the conference for next uh, couple of days. And with a desire to meet you all in some assembly in physical mode very quickly. And we are signing off for now and uh, we'll look we'll get back to you in the uh, keynote session thank you thank you very much bye bye thank you thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you sir thank you each one of you for joining us and encouraging us that is most important with your presence we are really encouraged and we will be we assure you that we will be keeping your expectations we will be trying to meet your expectations you are want from us to perform. Thank you. Now we will switch over to our uh, first keynote. Uh, keynote speaker is uh, Mr. San Cathy Lam. So I will just uh, read his uh, her uh, bio. Sushant Kathiland is a program manager for the U.S. Department of Defense, 
with more than 30 years of industry experience in the application of software engineering methodologies and the management of information system as well as leadership of software and system product development teams Kathy is an IEEE fellow and long time volunteer for the IEEE she is a member of IEEE entrepreneur committee she is currently the 2020 president elect of IEEE and was 2019 past vice president for IEEE technical activities and is a past president of IEEE computer society miss land is the author or co-author of number of text papers podcast webinars all supporting sound software engineering principles and practical application of software processes methodology so we are really privileged to have you miss susan kathilan kindly share your screen and the floor is open to you thank you thank you see if i can start sharing yes okay and you can or cannot see this webhex host thing that's floating on my screen can you see that we are able to see your slide what do you see we are able to see your slide so there is but, no but not yeah okay you don't see the box floating over it cuz i see a box floating over it you don't see that no boxes for all you the, just see the slide you know? yes okay you just see a slide but no webex box yes okay thank you okay thank you um i'm going to be speaking today about ieee software and system engineering standards and how we use them to to deliver an online game So I'm currently as you heard from my bio a, a program manager for the United States Missile Defense Agency. Um I cannot talk about my current job. Um most of my career I have worked in missiles and hardware in the loop and those types of things. Um but I had a foray into uh game development. So I'll talk about that how that happened and um the program I was on was called America's Army. So if you're not familiar with America's Army, it's still being produced. Um it's what's known as a, a massive multiplayer uh online first person shooter. And that's a mouthful. Um but it it was developed to promote army recruiting and espouse army core values, provide players with a complete virtual army experience uh with an emphasis on army core values, um authenticity, social responsibility, creating uniqueness in a in a very crowded gaming market marketplace. Um when I was involved it was at the end of my tenure uh with the overmatch version uh, there there were over 600 million registered users worldwide. So think about that and this was for the for the PC version of the game. Um this the overmatch version is what I will talk about it is the base version um and this is the re the releases they're still using us to build releases on today. So in addition to the public game, my responsibilities also included oversight of over 40 um Department of Defense training applications. So these are applications they used um to train soldiers and they were based on the same gaming engine. Um as the production planner, I was responsible for ensuring that all production in support of the public and DOD components remained on schedule. So basically in the gaming world, the production planner is, is the program manager. Um and that's what I do for the missile defense agency I'm a program manager. My background ranges from hardware in the loop as I described to uh simulation to classic database client server application programming. Although my current job is certainly the most challenging, the dynamics of each situation no matter how complex always seem to beg for the same thing, the fundamentals of applied software engineering if you're working in software and systems. So today as I said I'm going to talk about practical application of IEEE software and system engineering standards their application to software process improvement initiatives specifically the capability maturity model. All right so this is just an overview I'm going to talk about my role um as production planner the unique challenges I faced with the job uh describe what in more detail what America's Army uh is the program and the program challenges 
going to talk about why process improvement is important, even if you are in the middle of a crisis. I'll describe the tools we used, the CMMI and ISCLE software and engineering standards, specific standards we used, their application to the America's Army game, and then provide an implementation summary. All right, so America's Army, I told everybody, I told you it's a game, um, and it's produced by the U.S. Army. America's Army was, uh, was developed to promote, uh, to support Army recruiting, um, uh, and the seven core values of loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. That was what was focused on in development of this game. In addition to the public game, which required chat, uh, based in community, community sites, none of this was developed when I was um, in, in joining. Um, the America's Army Program Office supported uh, the basic skills trainer applications, or BSTs, using the same gaming engine, prototyping, education activities, um, the production of console games, specifically Xbox and PlayStation releases, cell phone applications, um, uh, and all associated marketing licensing program support all this was required, and none of this was in place. Okay, so um, the American Army's game had been around since 2002. Um, however, they had not had a successful release, um, a public release in 2002, and it was in bad shape. Um, so th things started to get interesting for the Army um, when they uh, began to transition to lessons from the public arena to training. The training programs were very successful. Um, they fielded some um, uh, basic skills trainers. I had a javelin trainer, which was a, a mock-up of the javelin weapon system, and they used the gaming engine, things like that. So um, it was during the same time that they started the, the major, try to field the major new public game release, which was Evermatch. Um, and they were not successful. So I was asked to come in and lead the public game efforts. So um, if you look at this slide, you'll see that um, here are the, my, my things that are released as the uh, production planner. So the special forces, the Evermatch match is version 2.7. Um, 2.6 to 2.7, those were, those were the ones that um, I was involved in. And then the 2.8 map editor. So you can see some of the things, um, the basic core release. Um, and then the, we did some things with um, uh, Real Heroes, which were um, uh, Bronze Star, Silver Star, and um, uh, um, Middle Winners, uh, which are, are people, uh, real soldiers we put in the game um, as, as a, so that people can learn about what you did to win their medals. Uh, a virtual recruiting station, uh, a crow's vehicle, um, anyway, I think the Mission Depot. <clears throat> we allowed uh, people in the community to build maps, and we had a map builder and submit their own levels. Um, so that was a great thing, so that it, it alleviated. Um, we had so many players, they you know would conquer a map level, and so this allowed the player community to submit new levels to the game. So that was, that was a great thing. All right. So this is a slide that I developed when Evermatch was first released. Um, I've left the numbers unchanged because I have 600 million users, right? So we started with 8.5 million registered users. This was when it was released. So that gives you an idea when we when we posted the game. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. We had to handle 8.5 million people registering. Um, so um, we had a very high brand recognition when you care, compare the cost of television. This is a marketing thing, right? So it costs five to eight dollars for every TV um, person hour, but for us it was 24 cents. So that's pretty good. Um, and then we had a lot of media attention. So you can see we had over 7,000 articles written when we at our initial release. Release. And then these are just some graphics. Now remember, you have to have some perspective. This is back in 2004 and 5, so graphics have improved quite a bit, but this was back in the day, as they say. All right, so I'm just going to run this a short video of the game, 
Um, again, the graphics have improved now if you play America's Army now, but this is too, this was cutting edge. Um, we were the first game developers to put ballistics models into the game. We got a number of patents. We modeled physics into the game, and um, I'll talk more about what we did later. But the engine we used is the Unreal Engine, and um, we were in touch with the developers quite a bit. We broke the model, um, their, their uh, software on a regular basis. So here we go. Let's see if I can do this. Okay, one thing to think about as you're watching that, and my, I'm, I'm using just a basic computer, not a gaming computer to play that, so that's why it was weird. But is that when we initiated this, we were using ballistics models. Um, we were, um, this was one of the first times that, you know, people could enter vehicles in a game, um, interact with each other in a game. Um, so we were breaking boundaries. It was a very exciting time. Um, okay, so this, Slide provides a description of some of the government applications or training applications. I already talked about the Javelin. Um, these were portable, affordable. Some of these systems we would sell to the government. We were government selling to government, but for five and six thousand um, dollars. And they were using. It was very groundbreaking because we were using gaming system controls, which soldiers already knew how to use because it's what they were using at home, right? for training systems. So they didn't have to learn any controls, right? So here, you know, they already knew they didn't have to be trained on how to use the controls. So all they had to know, all they had trained on was the system itself. So it was really an way to train soldiers. So um, we had uh, tow ITAS system, bunker defeat munition systems, nuclear biochem, um, uh, convoy operations live fire. Um, and one of the things that we What's really interesting is that we had, um, it basically it was this room, this was one of the more complex ones, but it was a room that had this malleable material that um, you, we projected the game on the walls. Soldiers would go in with live ammunition and shoot at the walls and it would absorb the bullets, but we could tell where they had shot and, um, and and whether or not they had successfully, you know, bad guy, good guy types of things. And so that was really one of the most bizarre things. And um, we did that for, um, I think it was CIA or FBI, but that was one of the most, one of the strangest ones. Um, so then um, the Crows, which was a full mock-up, it was, um, you actually got in the vehicle. Um, and we actually had one of these that we deployed um, uh, like at Las Vegas Speedway, we would take it on the road and um, let civilians go through it, um, you know, like a, I don't know, a Disney World type event, but to let people see what it would be like to drive a crow's vehicle and, you know, fire the weapon system and that type of thing. So that was kind of fun. I had to go on the road with that a couple of times, not to field it, but just to go see what was going on and see the, um, see the folks go through it. It was interesting. So anyway, all of this again was with the, the same gaming engine and it was with the same code base. So that was something we had to figure out how to do. Not only develop the game, but also leverage the same code base and have multi multiple um, efforts going on at the same time. So big configuration management challenges. Okay, so, um, so as the America's Army program grew, um, we had um, classic uh, software engineering challenges started to crop up. Um, you know, I talked about uh, these multiple efforts. The program office was trying to manage these. 
without dedicated production leadership, without employing software engineering best, best practices. Um, for Overmatch, a major new game release, um, the requirements were listed on a single notebook page of paper. Um, and they had already defined a release date. And this is not unusual for years. And the reason I got involved with IEEE, for years and years I'd gone from software engineering or, or, or software development effort to software development effort. And I would walk in either as, you know, project lead or, um, uh, you know, program manager and be handed a set of requirements that were very illy defined and a release date. And so, you know, here again is another example of the same type thing. So, um, but in this case, they wanted me and I wanted my expertise because I was known for delivering. Um, no development had yet begun. And so this is when I received the call. So I went to discuss this with uh, the Army. And um, at the time, I was a senior manager for Northrop Grumman, and I had my own section. I had 25 engineers, and I was technical director for a department in Huntsville. And so they needed me more than I needed them. And so this is important to remember. I had I could negotiate for change. So um, I went over there. So I talked about the requirements, and I, I took the picture, which was important. So I want to show you. This is what I received. This was what they had listed for requirements. And so these are the teams, right? And I'll show you where these are all located later. But this is the core integrator. Um, this was the, um, basically the, they're, all these are contractors, but this was the one that was working for the government that was the integrator, overall integration. These two are supposed to be working together, but they hated each other, virtual heroes and then the integrator. And so they're supposed to be working together on the baseline. Not a good idea. All right. So new user interface, that's a requirement. That's what they were saying. Okay, well, what's that supposed to look like? What's the design? Um, and, and they're supposed to start like in a couple of weeks. And this is all they have. And then this is, pardon me? And then this is so, Sun, we are not able to see your slides. Please, one second. Sorry. We are not able to see oh. the slides. We are seeing one gray color screen on your slides. So, can you just remove that screen? What screen is it? Oh, oh no. This is, this is a, a this is, you can't see this a list of requirements? Okay. I popped up a list of requirements. Can you see no. that? No, we are not able to see. That's why uh, I interrupted you. Oh, uh, so you see the slides again? Uh, no, there is a on over and above slides. There is a gray color window. It is popping up. Yeah, now it is removed. Yes, now we are able to see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I thought that it's not working, but but basically there. So what? I'll describe it. I'm so sorry. The pop-up's not working. So they had a list of single-page paper, list of requirements that um, had picture, just a single piece of paper with a list of requirements, and um, the with the companies that are supposed to work together. Um, and I'll talk about those later. Okay, sorry that, that my artifact didn't show because it's pretty glaring that this was not going to work. Oh, I hate that that didn't show. All right. Um, so, um, all right. So the project um, began to see uh, classic software engineering issues associated with requirements management, integration management, verification, validation, and these problems were multiplied by integration issues um, that geographically isolated development teams often experience. Um, and these were then additionally defined by corporate boundaries. And I just mentioned some of those previously about the teams that uh, were not, these different companies that were not working well together. And so they then add the market pressures associated with commercial game production. So although this was a government game, it was a commercial game. We were deploying it to the public. So it had to be treated like a commercial game and they were not treating it that way. So there was no 
um, in commercial game development, you go from an alpha to, I mean, from an alpha to a beta development, you go to beta testing. There are certain things that you do, and none of that was set up. The way it's deployed is, you know, when you're going to a global market, you'll see this, you do staging, and none of that was set up. So, um, so I'll go into some of the, many of the specific uh, other issues in, in some of the ex next slides. But, and they were also dealing with rapid program expansion and growth. You know, they were going into all of these trainer programs. They were trying to develop an Xbox and a PC, uh, I mean, a PlayStation version, um, a cell phone app, all of these things in parallel. It was just a big mess. All right, so here are some of the, uh, I wanted, when I talked about geographically diverse locations, there were over 20 America's Army development plat, uh, partners when I joined the team. And the number grew as we added qualified contracting and DOD agencies to the development team. Um, so these folks were spread over uh, uh, the United States, and, um, and these are just a few of the companies I, on this chart. So remember, this was in 2000. And, four, and we're talking together on webinars and everything's so, so nice and we're so technically enabled, but we did not have this in 2004. All of our meetings were done over the phone or in person, so we had challenges. Um, so um, we had several development studios, you can see in different time zones across the United States. And when I was talking, you couldn't see that other chart. Zombie Studios was one of the primary developers. They're pretty famous. Virtual Heroes on the right side of the chart, they're, they were one of our primary studios. Public Applications um, was a group that, that we hired, and they were individuals that we put together. And they were some of the most talented game programmers I have ever worked with. And they were my primary shop. Um, they, were, they were the integrators. And they... Um, I had guys that worked for me that would go on sabbatical and go work for um, Disney and program for Pirates of the Caribbean and then come back and work for me. It was just an amazing experience how talented these guys were. Um, so, but, but, um, so the guys at Virtual Heroes and the guys at the public applications, they hated each other. Like, this is when I came to it. These guys hated each other. They were supposed to be working on integration. There was no integration platform. There was no central code base repository. Um, Zombie was out there kind of doing their own things, being prima donnas. I mean, it was a big fat mess, right? Gearbox was off doing their own thing. So um, it was just, anyway, it was a lot of fun. So then they wanted me to come in and fix everything. All right, so I talked about um, the distribution challenges. So we had to consider how to prepare to globally distri di uh, distribute the software for downloads because the way it works then is that you said, we have a new game. If you want to buy the game, download it. Um, and so you had to figure out not only how to make it so that users could download it, a huge, huge game, and, and, and they could download it in a reasonable way on their PC, which was a challenge, but also to store the player data, balance the online online player loads, you know, because if you had, a, you know, a tremendous, let's say you had a huge number of players for some reason in San Jose, you had to offload that download distribution to, say, Chicago, right? But it had to all automatically happen, and, and you had to have the algorithms in place to do that. But the infrastructure for this did not exist, and we had to put this in place and find a contractor to do this. We didn't program it. We had a contractor do it. All right. So, um, so I talked about some of the integration challenges um, between uh, our APA group in San Francisco um, and some of the other pro, uh, pro, uh, folks. But you know, when I talk about software process improvement and gaming, people are shocked um, that this was successful. Um, when I came in, these folks were more than willing to listen. Um, I got most of the resistance from the government management because they wanted the product like right away. They thought that they were going to have this thing delivered in a year, and I had to come in and talk to the programmers and say, okay, what really 
are your requirements. Here's how you define requirements. Let's talk about this. Here's, let's talk about the design. And I had to push back on the government and say, you've got to give me three months. If you want me to lead this effort, give me three months and let me determine what the real requirements are. Let's, let me talk to these guys about the design and get estimates from them, real estimates um, for the schedule, because this is why you've not been able to deliver. And also, we've got to figure out how we're going to get this thing to market and how much time it's going to take for all these other pieces to get in place. And we've got to set up configuration management, a central code repository, and we've got to figure out how um, I've got to get a beta test team in place, right? All these things. So, 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 um, um, so, and and to resolve some of these problems you see on the screen with you know all this communication issues. So anyway, so that uh, took three months. They let me have. Of it and um, and we worked through some of these issues. Um, so we also had um, um, let's see if I've talked about these. So we had no test plan. I had a test manager in place. Um, I talked about the beta testing, but there was no VNV at all. There they the development part. You know, as each piece was delivered, what would happen is. Um, as the integrator AAPA would receive a piece from another um, uh, uh, entity, and um, that it would just fail, um, which was not a good thing. Um, AAPA was the last stop um, for um, uh, public release, and and it would just fall over on itself when they would receive a piece from another uh, um, uh, contractor. So. They would all point fingers at each other, so we had to fix that and get some formal. I had to set up a formal independent test team. Um, so um, we had no. Um, I've talked about this. No central code repository, um, and this was critical because um, without this, we couldn't support the training applications that I talked about earlier. Um, also, we had to um, what was existing there at the time. There were two. I found out there were two distinct code branches. Um, and so we had to merge the packages um, to get the 27 release that I talked about at the beginning of the, of the talk. Um, so not only was um, there not, um, nothing under CM, I found out that the Virtual Heroes team and the AAPA team had their own code branch. Um, so uh, that was a mess. All right. So um, let me see where I am in my notes. Okay, so um, so so my deal. So you remember, I stated that that the government uh, folks wanted me more than I needed this new program. Um, that I was the 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 problem was is I was gonna if I took on this new program, I had to take take it on in, in addition to my new my existing duties. So um, I, I talked about that I wanted time to define the requirements to develop a schedule. And what I didn't talk about is that I wanted full control. Uh, I told them I wanted to control the production baseline. And what this meant was that there would not be any just willy-nilly changing requirements for design. Because what had been happening in the past is that uh, there was a colonel that had been in charge of the program, and he would just walk into the de to the developers and say, I've changed my mind on this requirement. And this is classic. It happens on other programs. Um, but I. I've changed my mind. I want this to happen instead of this in the game. And so I told him that he could change his mind, but it would have impact on the schedule. So that that when I came to him with a schedule and promised delivery, that that would that promise would hold unless he came to me and changed the requirements, and then we would negotiate a new schedule. And so he agreed to that. And so we also had um, basic reviews. So a software requirements review, a, a preliminary design review, a critical design review, and a test readiness review. And at each one of these, I got agreement from the leadership, the colonel, and the uh, other folks um, about, do you agree with these requirements, yes or no? And it, uh, do you agree with this design, yes or no? Do you agree again with the design, yes or no? Are we ready for test? Everybody agree, yes or no? Because um, 
we wanted to make sure that, you know, we just didn't think that the requirements were right or the design was right. And this happens on other programs. But these were times where we could adjust the schedule if we had to adjust if we were off track. Um, so we set up the centralized code and made the configuration control board, um, had a single code base, but um, very important that the developers were all in all the different um, contractors were talking to each other. Developed, set up a beta test community, um, implemented independent IVNV, uh, had a test lead. Very, very, very important when you're working with multiple contractors that you have independent IVNV. And then um, set up this independent commercial software deployment um, capability. All right, so um, let's see. So uh, now, why pop, getting process improvement? Um, it seems to be an obvious question, but I'm asked. Uh, uh, I'm asked it a lot. Why process improvement? You were in crisis. You know, why take the time? Um, why not just keep coding? Lots of people do that. But um, so if you're in management or not, um, and I have management for, oh gosh, I guess about the last 15 years or so or more. Um, but I used to be a programmer. And I quit jobs because of the chaos. Um, you know, too many times where I was working until one or two in the morning, too many, too many hours, and I just got tired of it. And if you're good at your job, you don't have to put up with it. So, um, you know, I refuse to work in chaos and I refuse to manage chaos. So, and good people um, will eventually leave if that's the situation. So that's why you need process improvement. Um, and attrition, um, if you're in a situation like this will be your biggest problem. So um, if you wanna keep the best and the brightest, it only makes sense to promote an environment that promotes stability. And software sound software engineering practices do this if you're in a development environment. Okay, so this is a representation, just a very simple, I'm not gonna go into the, to, to the CMMI model or make it dry eyes out, um, but this is just a simplistic representation of the CMMI. Um, and if you work from the top down, from, they have maturity levels, um, and then you go into process areas and, and specific engineering goals, um, so I mean specific goal, goals and, and generic goals, and then specific practices um, and generic practices. And these are all just simply in fancy descriptive names for capabilities. Um, and the bottom line is you have to prove that your organization is performing in a confident manner according to a specific maturity level. And the reason that it's set up this way so that you can do checks, right? So at a maturity level two, um, and I'll go to the next slide. At a maturity level two, um, it's the managed level. And that means that um, you're ensuring that your product is being managed and that it's repeatable and that it's somewhat sane. And when I go into an organization that's in chaos, that's the level I try to target. Um, I, I've worked a long time and I've done. So, yes. So you are having another five. Oh wow. We have to have a five session as well. So please try to conclude. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Um, this is just a cross-reference of the standards that um, I that you can use to support um, CMMI, and you can see on the right the standards that support requirements management, project planning, monitoring control, quality assurance, all of the different standards. So there's a direct correlation. IEEE provides much support. All right, and then there's a life cycle standard which basically supports all of the business practices. So I'm going pretty fast. All right, so there's an ideal approach that was developed to support process improvement, which basically you initiate by suspect and learn. This helps you build more structure. And then it's important that you have a process team. All of this can be more or less formal, but I'm gonna go through this very fast. 
All right. So um, my artifacts won't launch, but I'll just tell you that we went from a very high level uh, set of requirements to a very, very detailed production schedule. Um, and we went from uh, a God agreement to move out from, we went from a one, a targeting a one year to a two, I got two and a half years added to the development schedule. Um, and we pretty much hit it on target for the delivery. Um, and successful, and it's still the baseline they're d delivering today, on today. So um, I think it's important to remember that when, if, if you ever try to do process improvement, that it's two parts software engineering, one part psychology. You have to remember you're trying to introduce discipline and you have to be careful um, to remember that people are resistant to change um, and to be flexible. Um, so uh, I did, if my, my books were mentioned, I do have a book that lays out all of what you need um, and provides documentation artifacts. Um, here's some additional resources, the standards, software engineering from IEEE. And I always recommend that people get involved. IEEE Computer Society is the organization that promotes software engineering standards and does the development IEEE. And I probably don't have time for questions, but I do thank you for the time um, to present today. Yeah, thank you, Sushan. Thank you very much for very, very exhaustive and nice presentation on the work which you have done in uh, US military. But still, we would like to have at least few questions because I can see a lot of questions are being asked for you. So I will take some two, three questions okay. and then uh, we will go to the next speaker. Great. So first question is being asked. Please. You want me to? Yeah, I will just read for you. You just answer. Yeah. How is okay. phys how is physics modeled in the game? This is the first question. Sure. Um, so both with the so in the in the game there would be explosions modeling when with, with um, shooting. Um, so um, so there are lots of different guns and ammunition, and so that's where the ballistics and the physics modeling will come. Also, like say you drop a rope and you want to climb up a rope, that type of physics, those type of things. And when this was started, how many years back we had this first time, this gaming software? That is the question. Um, so 2002, I started, but my my game was released, uh, I think 2006. I don't know. I'd have to go back and look. Uh, 2006 or seven. Okay. Next question. How many simulations for testing are conducted? Do you use Unity or Digital Twins quite a lot? Um, I didn't understand the question. Is it in chat? I will repeat again. How simulations for testing are conducted? So, are you, yeah. Are simulations are the simulations for testing connected? Is that what you said? Yes. How simulations are for testing are conducted? Do you use Unity or Digital Twin? Oh. Um, no, um, Unity, is that a software? Um, no, so the simulations for test, did we use simulations for testing? So, um, yes, but also it's key when you're developing a game that you use real people, because real people can break your game more than, because you're playing, this is, remember, this is a massive multiplayer first person shooter. So people are playing against each other. So we had to, we would do some sims, some simulations, but what we would really do is deploy this to a beta test community. We had a very loyal, very active set of beta testers. So um, we deployed to that community and let them try to break everything. So that, that really helped us. And that's what a lot of games do, is they, they send it to the beta testers first. Thank you. I will it's take a different way of testing. I will take last question because we are, we are reached 7:31. The question is being asked: Is was this project started as a fancy of a clever programmer 
and then evolved into a large application attracting the attention of the leadership team um no to my knowledge this was the brainchild of a colonel at west point who actually was in the office of economics and manpower um kt wardinsky and it was his idea to uh, use this to teach army core values and if people understood what the army really stood for then they would join so it was started as a recruiting tool um, and in the game, like if you, there's a training component, and in the game, if you turn around and shoot your instructor, you go to the brig. You can't shoot another uh, person that's in the army. There, there are things that you do in the game that, uh, that actually, you know, harm you as a player. But there, but throughout the game, you learn Army Corps values, and that's what they, that's what we always tried to, that's what the programmers always tried to remember. So it's different from other first-person shooters like um, Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> you know, or games like that. So, yeah, thank you very much, Sushan, for joining us from last one and a half hours because you have joined us for inaugural session and then agreed to deliver a keynote as well. So we are really honored to have you. I know there are a lot of questions I can see in the Q and A session, but uh, because of paucity of time, I am not able to take. But uh, from deep up our heart and on behalf of IEEE Bangalore section, I thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Thank you. So friends, now we are having our next speaker. But uh, before that, I would like to invite Professor KVS Hari, who is past uh, chair of IEEE Bangalore section as well as uh, vice president membership for uh, IEEE SP, a signal processing society. Uh, he was uh, attending one meeting, so he could not join us. Otherwise, he was supposed to chair this all the keynote session. So, Professor KVS Hari, over to you. Please handle the session for next two speakers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Puneet. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, so welcome uh, to the rest of the session, and I'm delighted to see uh, Professor Ramesh. Uh, my honor uh, to uh, introduce a good friend, uh, Professor Ramesh. Uh, professor Ramesh uh, is a Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Director and Lead uh, Principal Investigator of the Bridging the Gap Enhancing AIMS2 for Student Success which is supported by a multi-year grant from the U.S. Department of Education's uh, HSI STEM program. Uh, earlier, he served as the Dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science at uh, California State University in Northridge from 2006 to 2017. Prior to that, he was a professor of electrical and electronic engineering at uh, California State University, Sacramento, where he served as a department chair from 94 to 2006. In November 2019, Professor Ramesh was elected to the Abbott Board of Directors as the Director of Engineering Area Delegation of Abbott. Additionally, Professor Ramesh is an experienced IEEE program evaluator and has performed several Abbott accreditation visits in the U.S. and internationally. He has, uh, is a very uh, committed IEEE volunteer. He has served on several boards, including the IEEE Board of Directors, IEEE Educational Activities Board, the IEEE HKN Board of Governors, Abbott Board of Delegates. He served as the 2016-17 IEEE Vice President for Educational Activities, as well as the IEEE HKN President for 2016. He served on the IEEE Fellows Committee, IEEE Strategic Alignment Committee, Awards Board, and I think the list goes on. But his professional interests are in fiber optic communications, and he received the BE degree from University of Madras in 81, the master's and PhD degrees from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale in 83 and 86, respectively. He is a fellow of IEEE for contributions to entrepreneurship in engineering education. Uh, my pleasure and uh, delight to invite uh, Professor Ramesh. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Hari. Yes. Um, Puneet and colleagues, uh, can I begin sharing my screen? Can you pass the ball to me, please.
Yes, I think you are now the presenter. Terrific, thank you. And I hope that uh, I have a few videos to play, so when we get to that, we will uh, confirm that you're able to, to view them. Let's, uh, it's going to go into full screen mode there. Well, good evening, everybody, to all of you in uh, IEEE Connect in Bangalore. And I want to begin by first thanking uh, Professor Hari for that very, very gracious introduction. About four years ago, I was part of a delegation that visited Bangalore, industry outreach delegation to the board of directors. And in the space of about six months, uh, we were able to establish an IEEE and Capanew chapter at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the power of collaboration and the way in which IEEE works. Six months ago, none of us could have predicted the situation we were in. Yet here we are today, all seamlessly connected. You're in Bangalore, we have volunteers and members around the world, all over the world, doing the things that we do almost seamlessly. That is engineering, that is inspiration, and that is innovation. So I hope in the next uh, 20 minutes or so to share my thoughts with you. I know we got started a little bit uh, later than we should have, but uh, that was a fascinating uh, uh, talk by our president-elect, Kathy Lamb, so I want to thank her for that. Uh, first things first, uh, you begin by thanking the people who made this possible. I want to thank Professor Murli Dara, uh, Dr. Chandrakant Kumar, Mr. Paneet Mishra, uh, Professor S. N. Singh, uh, our IEEE leadership, uh, president-elect uh, Kathy Land, uh, director, Professor Akinori Nishihara, director-elect, uh, Deepak Mathur, past director, Dr. Ramakrishna, and Professor Bindamadwa. Thank you again, and Professor Hari for the introduction. So I thought I would begin by uh, just telling you a story, because when we think about innovation, often we hear that necessity is the mother of innovation. So I thought I'd begin with a story. So I live in California, in Southern California, and there is a not-for-profit company here called Not Impossible LLC. It's based in Santa Monica. And just like it sounds, not impossible takes on projects that people say there's no way that can be done and figure out a way to make it possible. So the story I'm about to share with you really quickly is about Tony Kwan, the gentleman that you see on the screen in front of you. Tony uh, is uh, born in LA and about 18 or 19 years old, he was affected with ALS. And very quickly, uh, he became paralyzed. He was unable to do anything. As a matter of fact, he needed to have a ventilator uh, in order for him to breathe. And the only thing that Tony could do before this happened, he was a wonderful artist. He was a great, great graffiti artist. In fact, uh, he's one of the well-known graffiti artists who's renowned in Gothic art and so forth. So Tony, uh, in his own words, says, I had my whole life taken away from me in the blink of an eyelid. That's how quickly things changed. Just like we're dealing with right now with the pandemic, so many changes and yet we have IEEE members all over the world who are inspired for working with engineers, making things possible. So this not-for-profit came together and they created this device called an iRider, right? So you say, what is an iRider? Well, the iRider uh, basically is able to respond to uh, the movements of his eye and through that he's able to communicate. So since he's paralyzed, if he needs the air conditioning to be turned on or if he needs food, he was literally blinking his eye and communicating with his caregivers. And the beauty of this particular project was they said, can we use the same device, a very simple device, to allow Tony to paint? So in short order, they brought together a team of hackers, a team of manufacturing engineers. They put some very, very simple off-the-shelf components together, infrared LEDs, CCD cameras, and as they say, a cheap pair of sunglasses, open source software, and the iRider is born. Ladies and gentlemen, the project that I'm describing to you happened about 10 years ago here in California. Since then, Not Impossible has grown tremendously. Mick Ebeling is the CEO and founder, and you can look it up uh, on the web to see what they've done. They've done Project Daniel in Sudan. They've done remarkable projects around the world, and it all goes to the fact that engineering combined with inspiration is a true source of innovation. So I'm not gonna dwell on my background. You already heard a lot about it. But I do want to share with you my students, the students who are there uh, in the bottom of this photograph right here. 
They're part of this program called AIM Squared, which actually stands for Attract, Inspire, Mentor, and Support Students. And these are first generation students who are first in their family to go to college. Really, really proud of them. We work with them on undergraduate research. We work with them on mentoring. And they graduate rapidly and go on to serve industry. Diversity and inclusion is a big, big part of our program. And we were recognized last year as a national program of the year in DC. But I'm really proud of my students who inspire me every single day to do the things I do and to serve IEEE and our members and volunteers around the world. So what is engineering? As engineers, we think about how we design, how we build, how we test, basically how can we do it. And then we start looking at the constraints, the attributes that work best. Building an unmanned aerial vehicle, if you're building a game, if you're building uh, technology, uh, transportation system, communication system, power system, whatever it is, what are the attributes? What are the materials? And then the innovation part comes up where you say, what is the impact? Now, clearly the story that I shared with you at the beginning, Tony Kwan, is one that inspires you that says, well, this is how engineering should work. I have to say a word about the um, heading that you see up there. That is a library, Cal State Northridge, uh, and that's the same thing as also home to Hollywood. So if you're a Star Trek fan and you're looking at Starfleet Academy, that actually was a backdrop for Starfleet Academy, except we used AI and virtual reality and converted the whole lawn in front of you into a virtual ocean. And sometimes when I have students coming in and they always ask me, Professor Ramesh, where exactly is the ocean? And I say, it's about 20 miles away, but we live in LA and unless we have an automated transportation system, it'll take you forever to get there. So jokes aside, when we think about engineering, we do a lot of things, but we do them carefully. We build blocks, whether it's a communication system, power system, transportation system, computer system. We look at predictive design. We want to minimize the uncertainty. And then we start making integration choices. We put things together. We evaluate and test them. And finally, we wait and see what the impact is. At the moment, the world is trying to race ahead to find a cure, a vaccine for COVID-19. If you think about the possibilities, there's something like 10 raised to 40 possible antiviral combinations. But due to the power of high-performance computing, companies like Hewlett Packard, the contributions of IEEE members worldwide, we've narrowed that down to about 20 possible combinations. And in short order, we're going to go to clinical trials and go on to hopefully develop a vaccine. But even this process, ladies and gentlemen, takes time. It might take six months, it might take a year, but you're racing ahead thanks to engineering, thanks to design, thanks to innovation. So let me talk about a few grand challenges that drive innovation. Uh, when you think about IEEE Connect, and you're going to talk about antennas, you're going to talk about propagation, communications, there's all kinds of fascinating sessions that are coming up in signal processing in the days ahead. But the fundamental challenges we face with energy, with the environment, climate change, sustainability, uh, the host in Bangalore, you're very concerned about clean water, providing nutritious food, healthcare, telehealth, telemedicine. The key to all of this, again, is education. And clearly, as we've seen, from around the world, the United Nations has come out with what's known as the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm not going to read these all out to you, but they're fundamental to human existence. Indeed, when you think about IEEE's mission, Advancing Technology for Humanity, it speaks very loudly, very clearly, very eloquently as to what uh, IEEE can do to pursue these kinds of goals. Eliminate poverty, eliminate hunger, provide good health, provide quality education, provide equality, uh, gender equality, sustainability, innovation clean energy, et cetera. So given all of these, I want to take a moment to acknowledge a couple of publications there. Uh, some of them are probably ones that you're very familiar with. The World is Flat by Tom Friedman uh, and Hot, Flat, and Crowded by Tom Friedman as well, uh, who, was, uh, who is a well-known columnist uh, for the New York Times. And through The World is Flat, basically Tom, about a decade ago, maybe 2008, was talking about how you could be in Bangalore or you could be in Bethesda, Maryland, or Beijing and China, and still be connected seamlessly as we are right now. So it's a flattening, a leveling of the playing field so that everybody is able to compete equitably, inclusively, in a very, very diverse manner. The two publications in the middle, and it's already 2020, but I urge you to take a look at them, The Engineer of 2020 and Educating the Engineer of 2020, are both publications from the United States National Academy of Engineering. They talk about how the engineering students and the graduates of tomorrow need to be analytical, need to be critical thinkers, need to be problem solvers, need to be excellent communicators, 
need to be diverse, need to understand different cultural ways, and have the ability to communicate their ideas to society. In short, we need programs that are entrepreneurial, that are outward focused engines of innovation. Hot, flat, and crowded talks about our energy future. Schoolmate of mine, I'm from NIT Trichy, which is back then called REC Trichy, uh, Dr. K.R. Sridhar, runs a company in the Bay Area called Bloom Energy that makes solid oxide fuel cells. One of the foremost companies in the world that provides distributed energy solutions wherever you are in the world. Again, the power of engineering, the power of inspiration, put it together, you have innovation. So this is another publication that I want to share with you. It's called Changing the Conversation. Incidentally, all of these publications are downloadable from NAE.org, which is the National Academy of Engineering. I'm not going to read this all out to you, but I just want to focus on one sentence right there. And this is about how engineering has a direct and positive impact on people's everyday lives. In case you're wondering about the choice of colors, those are my school colors, red and black, matador red and matador black. So from research to real world applications, engineers are constantly discovering how to improve our lives by creating bold new solutions that connect life in unexpected forward thinking ways, just like they're doing in IEEE Connect. So rather than us being face to face, we're all dispersed, we're all connected, and we're all working together collaboratively and inclusively. So I'm gonna talk about two interdisciplinary projects. One of them is called Learn to Code by Making Music. But before that, I need to give a shout out to my students. Every year when I was dean of the college, we ran this event called the Showcase. So all the disciplines, it's about eight different departments, they're all accredited by ABET. They demonstrate their projects to an audience that consists of the public, it consists of industry peers, and these projects span the gamut. It could be an unmanned aerial vehicle, it could be an aquaponics system, it could be a CubeSat project, uh, it could be a project that builds a steel bridge. No matter what the project, they're always looking at the outcomes and how those outcomes are delivering innovation to the community. Now, this project uh, in particular is very interesting for me because it brings together seemingly different disciplines. So all of you out there who are in the area of coding and computer science know that one of the fundamental courses that we try to teach our students is structural programming. And what these faculty did, Ani, Gloria, and Rick Alviso, Rick is actually chair of our music department, they came up with the idea that said, is there a way for us to teach computer programming by using music as a vehicle? Pretty interesting, right? So that's the website up there, and you can certainly go there. If you go and click on modules, you can actually download these modules and use them in your lesson plans. So it shows how there is a very, very good connection between loops and arrays, filters, all the things that we do in structured programming, and the same concepts can be applied to world music composition. But there is something that really, really attracted me to this project, and that is the students who are in this project started to create different types of music, hip hop, reggae. If you're in India and in Bangalore, you might be thinking about Carnatic music. Again, all of that has parallels to mathematics, all of that has parallels to programming. And by doing this, the students were hooked and they knew that they loved programming, they went on to do great things. Some of them went on to start companies and so forth. TIDE, and in case you're wondering what TIDE stands for, teaching to improve diversity and equity in STEM. Because innovation cannot be successful without diversity, without equity, without inclusion. And IEEE, ladies and gentlemen, is built on those three platforms. Our members are dispersed around the world. They work together collaboratively to make technologies possible. We advance technology for humanity through the IEEE, through efforts like these. The other project that I want to mention to you is a intelligent wheelchair project. Now, the student who worked on this project is also the researcher, Lee Hearn, whom you see right here, Lee works for the US Navy, and Kathy might recognize uh, he worked for NAVAIR here in Camarillo. Uh, President-elect Kathy Land was in that area many, many years ago uh, working. So what these students did, many of them are video gamers. If you're a student in the audience, you play different video games. And what the uh, students did is they said, can we use the same technologies that we use to play a video game to be able to use our mind to control a wheelchair, right? So if somebody is, uh, cognitively sharp but physically challenged, can they use their mind and their thoughts to control a wheelchair? So uh, this is an intelligent wheelchair. This is designed to operate autonomously using the user's thoughts. And it's been able to do this in very busy environments, both indoors and outdoors. Uh, so it consists of a camera, it has a GPS, uh, it has a laser range finder, and obviously it has a computer. Uh, the elements of this uh, device, or the system, are all controlled using LabVIEW, 
And LabVIEW is virtual instrumentation software that the students put together. In short order, they created an artificial neural network that could take inputs from a variety of these sensors, whether it's a camera, a GPS system, a laser rangefinder, or very interestingly, something called a modem. Modem is a headset that you wear that allows you to play video games. So if you're pushing an object, pulling an object, et cetera, on a video game, instead of using a joystick, you can use a modem to do it. Well, the beauty of what the students did is to say, the same system that allows us to do things on screen, can we take that and convert those thoughts into a motion command, right? And do that with no latency so that you compare your EEG waveform with an artificial neural network and determine the probability that that's where you wanted to go. That's the direction you wanted to go, right? Sounds like science fiction, but 10 years ago, they were actually able to implement this and deliver this uh, to a client. I'm gonna show you a video right here. I hope you can see it. Uh, what you're seeing right there is Lee navigating a hallway essentially with his thoughts. So as he thinks he wants to move forward, the wheelchair interprets his thoughts with the artificial neural network. It is able to then take the wheelchair forward. Of course, it has fail safe. It has the GPS system. It has a camera. It has a navigation system. As you can see in front of him, uh, it is looking at obstacles. It is looking at ways to avoid those obstacles. Again, we've done this in an indoor system. We've done this in an outdoor system. But imagine the power that this gives somebody. In other words, a wheelchair that you can control just by using your thoughts to move forward. Right? A wheelchair that doesn't require the user to physically push themselves. A wheelchair that you can seemingly control as if it was science fiction. So this is the power, again, of innovation the power of engineering, the power of inspiration. And when you think about this, you say, well, uh, how did this all start? It all started with a group of students who were just playing video games, right? And the students said, how can I use the technologies that I'm playing with to do some good for humanity, advancing technology for humanity? So we did something further. We said, how can we bring all of these different ideas together and create a program? In this case, the program we created as assistive technology engineering. I'm going to play another brief video so you can hear from our students right there. One thing that has really impressed me about this program is the synergy between electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, biomechanics, biology, anatomy, in computer science because everyone comes from different backgrounds and you're taking classes in not only engineering but you do this from uh, mechanics and biology. Everyone got to help each other out and you got to see different views of each class and kind of what's about the class. How we will learn from each other and I quite appreciated that aspect. And the great thing about the faculty here is they have a way of channeling this to go different classes, whether it be robotics or electronics or whether it be a biology class. A lot of the faculty all different disciplines and all working together to try to bring their field to the fore. I would recommend this program to others who are seeking an opportunity to learn mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, um, biomechanics, and really to see the background of what creates devices and how to bring them to market. It takes both the human factor side and the engineering side. It was a absolutely positive experience. I have to say that As you noticed, this program started about a decade ago, inspired by projects like the Intelligent Wheelchair. It is completely online. And ladies and gentlemen, we didn't just do this after COVID-19. It's been online. So if you want to sit there in Bangalore or anywhere in the world and take this program, you can do that today. And as you can see, the curriculum is really interdisciplinary, integrative, brings biology and engineering together, software development. Uh, they work with clients to create these products and processes to make people's lives better. Check it out if you get a chance. I want to talk about IEEE's role, because IEEE, I think, is a catalyst, is a beacon of hope, a beacon of light in these challenging times. And one of the things that always strikes me when I think about IEEE is our strategic plan. Drive global innovation through broad collaboration and the sharing of knowledge. That is number one in our strategic plan. We do that with trust. We do that with service to humanity, with integrity, global community building, 
growth and nurturing and partnership and we inspire a worldwide audience like we're doing today by building these communities, whether it's 5G, IoT, smart grid, artificial neural networks, computers, whatever society you're from, it's about building communities to advance technical interests, inform public policy, and expand our knowledge and benefit humanity. So one of the things that I want to quickly give a shout out, the next week I'm going to be talking on an ABIT workshop also hosted by the India Council. ABIT is the global accreditor of engineering programs, computing, applied science, and um, technology. IEEE is the largest member society within that. And this ensures that graduates are prepared for professional practice. Again, it's not about your individual silo disciplines, it's about how you're serving humanity. Engineering plus inspiration equals innovation. So let me briefly talk about Ada Capanew and Epics and IEEE before we come to a close here. Ada Capanew is the Honor Society of Electrical Engineering, scholarship, character, and attitude. You need to be invited to participate. We have about 200 chapters around the world. And as I mentioned to you, we were delighted uh, that Professor Hari and his colleagues at the Indian Institute of Science helped establish a new chapter at um, the Institute of Science in Bangalore. What is remarkable about Ada Kapanew is that our students uh, tell us now, many, many years later after they've graduated, that the skills that they learned, the collaboration that they learned, the community that they learned by being a member of the Honor Society are the ones that they use every single day in their lives as they go forward. So check it out if you get a chance. Uh, community service, uh, there's over 100,000 hours of community service that our Ada Kapanew members around the world provide every single year from across our chapters. The other program that I want to mention to you again uh, in line of this keynote is EPICS. EPICS stands for Engineering Projects and Community Service. And I know many of you in India are very, very familiar with this program. It has four pillars, access and abilities, education and outreach, environment, and human services. And fundamentally, EPICS brings together students at the university level, gets them to work with the pre-university students, and sustainably work with a nonprofit organization. I say sustainably because these are not one-off projects. These are projects that live long beyond the conclusion of the project so that individuals and community can benefit. So when I was vice president for educational activities a few years ago, we wanted to go just beyond those individual projects. We wanted to see how we could make this work in a sustainable way in the curriculum. So we started something called EPICS 2.0. Uh, Purdue, again, is where EPICS started under former president, uh, Professor Leah Jameson and Bill Oakes, who is the founder of the EPICS program. We made a partnership with universities in India and we called it EPICS 2.0. This is at the MOU signing ceremony with Professor Oakes and a number of colleagues from India who actually showed up to do this. So what was this partnership all about? Rather than doing the individual projects on access and abilities or energy environment, education outreach and human services, we said, if you're an educational institution, you need to make community service a part of your curriculum, freshman year, junior year, sophomore year, senior year, whatever it is. And the student needs to be thinking about how their disciplines are going to serve community. You also need to establish a lab so that students can participate in this lab. The EPICS program will provide support, technical support, as well as consulting. And you need to demonstrate your projects to an audience of public. In other words, everything that I've talked about here is what we try to do in an institutional way across India. And I'm delighted that we were able to do this in a variety of institutions. That's my alma mater at NIT. I want to give a shout out to Professor Raghavan, who is right there in the middle, who recently retired, and microwave theory and techniques, and Professor Bhakta. They're the two leaders uh, who started this program, and then Professor Mini Thomas, who is the director of NIT. Uh, Trichy, also an avid IEEE member. So we established this at my alma mater. There's uh, 12 other schools in India, most of them in the state of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, about five of them in the state of Tamil Nadu, to actually institute curriculum to move forward. So as we get close to the end of my talk, I want to say, how can we put this all together? I started out by saying innovation combines engineering, combines inspiration, combines diversity, combines inclusion, to make all that happen, make it innovative. There's one word I haven't mentioned, and that word is collaboration. Collaboration is very, very critical to a success, no matter what we do. At the moment, we have this pandemic, but who knows what the challenges lie ahead. But no matter what the challenge, we need to be able to provide a platform for people with diverse thoughts, diverse ideas, to come together as a community to solve the problems in front of them. One such example, in the IEEE is our IEEE Learning Network, ILN. So if you go to IEEE and check it out, 
It's an initiative we started when I was VP for education again a few years ago, and it brings all the technical societies together to host their content, short courses, webinars, whatever you want to do, right? If you're a student, an entrepreneur, industry practitioner, you will find something there all the way from beginning to intermediate to advanced level. Try Engineering Summer Institute. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that face-to-face -face this year, but I'm sure we'll come up with a virtual solution in the future. Try Engineering together, mentoring young students in engineering, connecting them with professionals through our Try Engineering portal. Again, collaboration is the key to our success. Engineering and inspiration combined with collaboration, with diversity, with inclusion can lead to innovation. So I'm gonna close, ladies and gentlemen, by asking you a question. And I know the answer to this, but I still wanna ask the question rhetorically. Do you wanna make a difference in the world? And I think unambiguously, unequivocally, and openly and transparently, every single person in this audience who's hearing this talk is gonna say, yes, I do. I wanna make a difference in the world. I want to advance technology for humanity. I want to do it the IEEE way. Well, let me share some values with you on how you can do it. Work with young people. Work with young people because the future belongs to them. They have the ideas, the professions that we haven't even thought about, the societies that we haven't thought about. Bring them together to make a difference in the world. And do it by being collaborative, by being accountable, being resilient, being ethical. Above all, be inclusive. And this is a pledge that I take every single day in my IEEE life. I've been a member for 38 years. I care. Inclusive, collaborative, accountable, resilient, ethical. Again, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Engineering plus inspiration equals innovation. So here's my contact information, s.ramesh at IEEE.org. Uh, as we say in India, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I believe we've got a few minutes for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and open it up to our moderator to moderate the questions. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ramesh. I think it was a very inspiring talk, and we are very happy that uh, you could share your thoughts with all of us. And many of us would resonate uh, with your uh, ideas and uh, uh, plans. So let me... Uh, see if uh, I can get hold of a few questions. Uh, Sir, you are able to see Q and A through your mobile, or shall I read? I can. Yeah, I am only seeing nine of them, so I don't know. Uh, can you read yeah. out, Puneet? If, thank you yeah. very much. Sure. So, thank you, Professor Ramesh, for a very, very thought-provoking and inspiring talk. So I will take out few questions only because already Mahata is uh, waiting for uh, her session. No worries. But, I think I took, uh, I didn't go over, did I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We started late for your session, five minutes, no so worries. that is okay. <laughs> so the first question is being asked by Professor S. Raghavan. You have just mentioned he is asking social distancing beats technology in the case of COVID-19. Your comment? Right. So at the moment, you know, we have to do social distancing in order to protect ourselves. But at the same time, uh, last week I was sitting at the IEEE board series and I heard about different societies. The IEEE Signal Processing Society, ICAST, had the largest attendance at their conference, at their virtual conference. So we need to be thinking about hybrid modes. We need to be thinking about different ways of learning, doing things. The future of work is going to change for Saragwan. It's not going to be the same again. And in a good way, because I think advancing technology for humanity is a very noble cause, right? And this is something that I think we can all wrap our hands around. We can truly innovate, provided we are open to new ideas and new ways of doing things. Uh, next question is, how AI and machine learning is related to assistive technology? That's a great question. So when we think about uh, the projects that I described, it brings together biology, it brings together different disciplines in engineering, software engineering, put this all together. Now, at the bottom of this, if you start digging deep, you find that there's a tremendous amount of data that needs to be processed. Decisions need to be made in real time. Whether you're driving a Tesla, or you're driving a wheelchair, decisions need to be made by that autonomous device about what is safe, what is efficient, what is the best way to do it. So you need machine learning technologies, you need AI, and you need to do this 
with relatively low latency. In other words, you could be a surgeon in New York operating on a patient in France, operating a gallbladder, let's say, and use a robot to actually make that incision. We can do that today with our technologies. It would not happen without AI. It would not happen without machine learning. It would not happen without predictive analytics that we need to improve our systems. But we need to continuously improve. I would say we barely scratched the surface with where we are with AI. Yeah, I will take last question from Lance Fung. He is asking, can you comment on the importance of infusing ethics in the education and development of engineers and professionals? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fung. That's a beautiful question. Uh, I believe no matter what discipline you're in, you start by doing what is necessary. Soon you find yourself doing the possible, and eventually you find yourself doing the impossible. Sounds like an engineer, but it actually was St. Francis of Assisi who said that. Ethics to me is foundational, right? We just passed the IEEE just last week, passed a, a new code of ethics. So look it up. So the IEEE, again, is a very inclusive organization. We believe in bringing together diverse cultures who speak different languages, who look differently, who may have cognitive diversity. In other words, they think differently from us. But we always need to be ethical. We always need to be doing the right thing when nobody is looking. That, to me, is a very simple definition of what ethics is all about. And we can get through this. COVID-19 is just a blip on the radar, ladies and gentlemen. We have a glorious future ahead, thanks to organizations like IEEE, thanks to IEEE Connect, and thanks to the wonderful volunteers and leaders that I see around the world. So thank you very much, uh, Puneet, for the opportunity and to the IEEE Bangalore section again. Vanakkam, as we say in Tamil Nadu. Thank you, thank you, thank you very you much. much. Thank you. Yeah, and let's, uh, over to you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So our uh, uh, next speaker uh, is uh, Professor Mahata Mogadam. Uh, oh, there I see. Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, is the Ming Shai Chair in Electrical and Computer Engineering, Director of the New Research Initiative at the Vitabi School of Engineering. Co-Director of the Center for Sustainability Solutions and Distinguished Professor at the University of Southern California. Prior to that, she was at the University of Michigan and uh, NASA Jet Professional Laboratory. She received the BS degree from the University of Kansas, Lawrence, with highest distinction and the MS and PhD degrees uh, from UIUC, all in electrical and computer engineering. She has introduced new approaches for quantitative interpretation of multi-channel radar imagery based on analytical inverse scattering techniques applied to complex and random media. She was a systems engineer for the Cassini radar and served as science chair of the JPL TMAX. Her most recent research interests include the development of new radar instrument and measurement technologies for subsurface and subcanopy characterization development of forward and inverse scattering techniques for layered random media, especially for root zone, soil moisture, and permafrost applications, geophysical retrievals using signal of opportunity reflectometry, and transforming concepts of radar remote sensing to medical imaging and therapy systems. She is a member of the NASA Soil Moisture Active and Passive Missions Science Team and a member of the NASA Cyclones Global Navigation Satellite System science team. She was the principal investigator of the Air Moss NASA Earth Ventures 1 mission. She served as the IEEE Antennas and Propagation Magazine from 2015 to 2019 and currently the president of the IEEE Antennas and Propagation Society. She is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and we look forward to your talk now. Thank you for, very much for, for that introduction. We appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, to give this talk. It's a great honor for me to do that. Um, very glad to see um, uh, everyone online and uh, congratulations for being able to uh, to arrange for this online conference. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, so I'm uh, going to see if I can share my screen. And, and I will assume you can see it unless I hear otherwise. Can you... Uh... Make the speaker the host. Are you able to see Making, my screen? No, I think uh, you. Let me try again. Can you just okay. share again? We are not able to see your screen. 
Okay. Are you how about now? Can you see it now? It I see the message that says I am sharing my screen. Yes. You're yes, you, now if, we can see your yeah. Maybe okay. you can make it full screen in presentation Absolutely. mode. Yeah. Yes, of course. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. So, uh, so the talk I'm uh, going to present today is based on a, a more extended version um, of this presentation as part of my IEEE Geoscience Remote Sensing Society Distinguished Lecture uh, Series. Uh, so, I'm, uh, as was mentioned, um, uh, I'm the president of Antennas and Propagation Society, but I also have affiliations with other societies, including GRSS. Uh, so, of course, you know, these are all sister societies, a lot of overlap between the topics that we cover. Uh, I would like to gratefully acknowledge uh, several of my uh, current and past group members who have contributed to the material that I'm presenting here. And their, their names are stated here. Uh, again, these are, uh, these are the people who actually do the work, my graduate students, postdocs, various you know, research members uh, within the group. And the topic is microwave sensing through the subsurface for addressing the water puzzle. Let's see. Okay. So let's talk about water. Of course, no, we are engineers. We, you know, we, we like to work with engineering and engineered systems, observations, measurements, but how do we impact the world? As uh, my colleague, uh, previous speaker, was so um, in a very articulate way, mentioning in the last question, do we want to make a difference? Well, so this is one way in which with our engineering tools, we may be able to make a difference. Let's, let's think about water. So what are some of the facts? About 2.5% of the world's water is fresh water, which is what we need to live. Population is obviously growing, but the quantity of fresh water is not. In fact, you could argue that we are losing fresh water uh, in that, for example, glaciers are made, melting, ice is melting. So fresh water in the form of ice is joining um, sea water or salt water. So you could argue that um, not only the fresh water is not increasing, it's actually decreasing. So let's stick with that 2.5%, however. So if from that, uh, according to the latest estimates, 68.7% are in glaciers, snow, and ice caps. Uh, and 30.1% of that 2.5% is in groundwater. Only 1.2% of the 2.5% is in surface water, and that's the part that's accessible most easily to us. And we're talking about 1.2% of the 2.5%. So now we have four decimal uh, places here uh, in terms of how much overall water is uh, on the Earth or within the Earth. So that surface water, which is only 1.2% of 2.5%, is a small fraction, but it's very important in partitioning the water cycle and influencing and the interactions between the water and the carbon and energy cycles, in fact. And that's what actually uh, impacts the, uh, the, the global climate patterns. Uh, one of the issues in particular that is of concern uh, is that 1.2%, uh, that it includes water in permafrost, which is quite vulnerable to worms uh, in the higher latitudes in the Arctic. And that provides very strong feedbacks to uh, the global carbon cycle and uh, the climate patterns. So uh, of the available water, the fresh water, by far the largest portion, the lion's share, is used by agriculture worldwide. By some accounts, about 80% of that is used by agriculture. And uh, a lot of, or many of the highly populated areas in the world are impacted by um, uh, but both the agricultural uh, use of water and also what's, what remains for um, urban use. And these include, obviously, you know, arid, semi-arid areas like the southwestern U.S., India, Australia, western coast of, coast of South America, Middle East, uh, North Africa, and West and Central Asia. So a huge uh, uh, region in the world is impacted by that. The U.S. intelligence community has identified water-related issues as an important factor in the worldwide uh, threat assessment. So it is uh, what, by some accounts, the next wars will be fought over. Um, despite this importance, reliable adequate measurements do not really exist right now to characterize the dynamics of water, especially the part that's not really available to us, like ground uh, water. Uh, and so the engineering techniques to explore 
uh, water quantity, especially in the subsurface, are uh, uh, really poorly developed. However, on the bright side, again, we are engineers, uh, especially in the microwave uh, community. Uh, what we have going for us is that uh, microwave um, signals in the electromagnetic signals in the microwave range are primarily sensitive to the presence of water. So here we have potentially a tool for allowing us to monitor um, uh, water quantity and decide what to do about it. So the main pieces of the of this global water, let's call it puzzle, that are currently poorly quantified and we would like to quantify are these three things that I have um, listed here. There's snow, uh, the water in soil, and also water in the ground. So soil moisture would be the uh, water in the soil that's in the shallow part of the subsurface, and then groundwater would be a little bit deeper. We're talking about several meters or tens of meters versus soil moisture in the several top centimeters. So as we go from the surface, which so there will be snow and soil moisture and the groundwater, uh, as we want to explore water in the deeper layers, we have to go to decreasing microwave frequencies, longer wavelengths, um, lower frequencies. But at the same time, uh, because it becomes increasingly opaque to be looking for water under the surface, it's also that the detection becomes more and more difficult. So our job as engineers and remote sensors becomes more and more difficult as we look through deeper and deeper uh, parts of this uh, uh, water quantity. So here in the next uh, several minutes, I would like to focus on uh, mostly soil moisture and a little bit on groundwater. Uh, snow is uh, also very important, but I will not be talking about that right now. That's, that could be a whole separate uh, talk. Uh, so most popular sensors for, for mapping um, soil moisture in particular are uh, airborne space-borne um, radars, microwave radars, and this includes particularly synthetic aperture radars or SAR instruments. Uh, SARs are um, notoriously expensive, they're very finicky, they're, they have these high-power transmitters which are expensive to develop, they're very heavy, and uh, they're also uh, oftentimes the main reason uh, SAR systems um, fail because they're, uh, again, they're um, very sensitive. And uh, so along those lines, and I'll get to this a little bit in this talk, but I just want to mention that the, the vision that we really are interested in implementing in uh, tracking different pieces of the water puzzle is uh, not just the standard uh, radar systems or SAR systems, but what I'm going to call SAR plus. Uh, and that includes using what we call signals of opportunity or SOAPs. Uh, so using transmitters of opportunity, which are already there, like GPS transmitters, for example, could be FM radio signals, even Wi-Fi signals, uh, some military communication satellites, and so forth. So uh, the question would be, well, can we enable, enable pervasive and inexpensive uh, monitoring of our water resources by using not only our standard or conventional radar systems, but also augmenting it with uh, other uh, signals of opportunity, also, uh, you know, we cannot really do a good job of monitoring geophysical products like water without having some sort of uh, in situ or ground based monitoring, at least for validation of what we observe, observe from remote platforms. Uh, but also something that on top of all of these, one thing that uh, has recently become of interest is using drones or UAVs on manual vehicles for uh, doing this job of uh, remote observations of water resources. So when we put all of these things together, the whole the overall vision that uh, I'm proposing we go for, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, you will find some interest in at least one of these components is what I've shown here, which that okay, we have our conventional sensors like the satellite sensors or airborne sensors. We have signals of opportunity systems. So if we have a GPS satellite sending its signals, which we normally use for navigation purposes, but those are microwave sources and we could use the reflected signals from GPS as, uh, as our source of remote sensing observations. We can have in situ sensor networks on the ground and of course we can have various drones or UAV based sensors also helping. And each of these will cover different scales of time and space and by putting all of these together, is um, really in the next several years or within the next decade, hopefully this is where how we can enable um, continuous high resolution or multi-resolution observations of various um, resources. 
So let me just say a few words about radar, and um, you're probably already familiar with all of this, but uh, just humor me for a few minutes while I go over the basic concepts of a radar system. So uh, radars are simple pulse echo um, instruments. Of, and when I say simple, I don't mean they're actually simple uh, systems. They are the, the basis of observation is a simple thing, which is that we have transmitters which send the signals to an, an antenna. Uh, the signals hit uh, the observation region or a target or what we call the scatterer, which scatters the signals uh, towards the receiver. Uh, you, we send pulses that I've shown in, in the bottom uh, figure here. So you have uh, periodic pulses that get sent out as transmit, and we listen to the echo coming back. So we have the received signal, which is smeared out because of the shape and timing um, associated with that particular scatter. And this process continues. We usually go over uh, the area of interest in a moving platform, so satellites, air, uh, airplanes, drones, and um, the basis of observation then becomes the received power, which I've shown in this equation um, top right. The power is related to the transmitted power via various system uh, properties and target properties. Uh, so uh, we could implement the system as, uh, so if you look at the figure on the right hand side as either what we call the bi-static, so transmit and receive could be two different platforms, or a monostatic system, which uh, has the transmit and receive systems both on the same platform. The picture on the left is the more standard radar scenario, monostatic radar, where you have the same antenna acting as a transmitter and, a, and the receiver. And then the signal of opportunity, like the GPS scenario, would be the one on the right, where transmit and receiver on separate platforms. So what happens here? If we look at the conversion of how the signals propagate, so let's say that you have some sort of a natural environment, and uh, in the case of the monostatic or the traditional radar, you have your incident waves coming here, hitting uh, your scattering scenario. Let's say you're uh, in a forested region. Uh, the signals interact with your trees, for example, with the buildings as well. Some part of it, uh, part of the signal gets transmitted back directly from um, your transit on the surface. Some part of it goes through the object, interacts with the ground, and possibly underneath the layers underneath uh, the surface of the ground, and then they come back, traverse the same path back to your receiver. Uh, if you have a bi-static observation scenario, the signal of opportunity, your signals come in here, interact with your targets, with the ground, and signals get uh, reflected back or scattered back to the receiver, wherever they might be. And this really is the basis of our observations. Thinking about uh, the topic we started with, which is water, if you're interested in identifying how much water there is under the surface in the soil, the signal that comes back from the scattered waves uh, from the soil, that contains the information we need from uh, or, or to form our, uh, that piece of the water puzzle. Of course, you know, we have to uh, make some simplified models to retrieve information from this very complicated signal. So what we do computationally in our, in our electromagnetic models, we build uh, models of whatever scatterers we have on top of the ground. In, in this case, I've shown a tree. This could be a building, could be a whole forest, could be a crop field. So we divide up the scenario into pieces that we can handle computationally. In this case, you see small cylinders or disks. Uh, or whatever the case may be in terms, in, in the case of that particular scatterer. And then we have also the ground layers. That could be many. So we start from the top layer and then we, uh, we discretize the ground layer into however many layers that make sense. Uh, so we go into a very large computational domain. Uh, and, you know, these, uh, for those of you who are familiar with this type of model, and these have been the topic of research for a few decades now, and very complicated computational algorithms have been developed to uh, construct uh, these models. So uh, let's go back to water. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, you know, soil moisture is one of the things that, are, uh, that we are very interested in, and uh, in putting in our uh, big water picture globally. It has had a long tradition in microwave uh, remote sensing. We've had radars and radiometers, radars being the active instruments. So we have both transmitters and receivers, or radiometers, which are just receivers. So radiometers uh, sense 
uh, the, the natural black body radiation of, of a given target. Uh, and both radars and radiometers have been implemented through different platforms, such as satellites or, air, uh, or airplanes, and also some in situ sensors, as well as tower based um, sensors. Most of these has, uh, have been done for surface soil moisture. Uh, mapping profiles of soil moisture down to the root zone is a more uh, recent phenomenon. And for that, because of the attenuation of microwave signals, we need to go to long wavelength radars. And uh, for that, there is no satellite system yet, but we have recently demonstrated the airborne version of uh, such instruments. So the state of the art right now is long wavelength radar on uh, an airplane. Uh, so is the topic of in-situ sensors for, I, I've mentioned it here, but I'm not really going to talk about it because we don't have too much uh, time to focus on that right now. Let me show you an example of what a surface soil moisture map from a satellite platform looks like. So the images you see here, the one on the left, bottom left, this is from the NASA Soil Moisture Active Passive um, Radar Mission or SMAP mission. So SMAP was, as the name implies, uh, active and passive. So it had, had the radar and the radiometer. The radar unfortunately uh, failed after a few months of operation. But during the time that it operated, it actually produced very nice um, data. What you see here is one example. So this is the, the mean backscattering cross section a uh, global map of what SMAP was able to measure. And, and uh, on the side, you see the derived soil moisture. This is the mean soil moisture from the SMAP satellite uh, during a couple of months of observation. So uh, this uh, was the best ever uh, map, global soil moisture map that was produced um, at the time. So this is an example of what a satellite system can do. It is a surface soil moisture map, so this does not really tell us what's beneath the surface. This is just the, the top few centimeters of the surface. Now, in contrast to that, or maybe we shouldn't call it a contrast, but in addition to that, what we have accomplished recently is through uh, this other mission and the associated instrument called the Microwave Observatory, Airborne Microwave Observatory of Subcanopy and Subsurface, or AIRMOX, which was um, also supported by NASA, and it included contribution of uh, more than 10 institutions here. So this is an airborne uh, mission or airborne instrument on uh, board a NASA airplane, the Gulf Stream airplane. What you see down there here, um, hanging from the belly of the airplane, is a pod that includes the radar, the AIRMOX radar. And this radar is a P-band radar, operates in the frequency of 420 to 440 megahertz. So the wavelength would be about 70 some centimeters. So this is so far still uh, the state of the art in low frequency radar for subsurface applications. With this instrument, we map many locations in North America, starting you know, from, the north, from the northernmost site being in Canada, central Canada, all the way down to uh, the tropical rainforests in Costa Rica in Central America. And there were a total of about 10 sites that we covered with this radar with the purpose of mapping uh, root zone soil moisture, subsurface soil moisture. Uh, so the, kind of in a nutshell, this is how this is done. So on the left-hand side, you see a typical radar image generated by the system. Uh, this image becomes an input to uh, this uh, very complicated computational model that we have for each of these sites. I call this a sausage maker that from the other side of it out comes the actual sausage, which is the, the maps of soil moisture. And the maps of soil moisture that we have produced are, I'll show you in some of the upcoming uh, slides, it's not just the surface, but we also can uh, retrieve the soil moisture down to um, many tens of centimeters below the surface. Uh, so, uh, again, another cartoon just to show what, how we model our um, areas of interest. We can have vegetation on top of the surface. The surfaces are rough. That's how nature is. We uh, represent the soil moisture profiles as some sort of a closed form function so that we can um, kind of um, get a handle on how many unknowns we can handle through these models. And then we run uh, this whole thing through an inversion uh, loop. So we, for each site, we have some prior knowledge that we have. Uh, we start our iterations with some arbitrary estimate of what soil moisture is or that, what that profile is. Uh, 
we activate our computational model with those initial wrong, but initial just some starting point for those models. From that, we estimate uh, the screen cross section or the radar observation that we expect. We compare it with what we observe. We go through this uh, inverse problem, which is an optimization problem. We come up with new estimates of the variables, those unknowns, and this loop continues until we have convergence and we, have, we know that we have confidence that we have achieved a good solution for our uh, roots on soil moisture um, estimates. Just to show you some examples, this is an example I'm going to show you from uh, location in Arizona, so the vegetation on top, many uh, layers under the surface in the ground. And uh, here's what, what we can retrieve from our radar observations. So the different panels here are maps of soil moisture at different depths. Uh, the axes of these graphs are geographic latitude and longitude. So vertical axis would be the latitude, horizontal axis, the longitude. The size of each of these patches is about 100 kilometers long and 25 kilometers wide. Uh, the color scheme is, this is supposed to show soil moisture quantity goes from right no moisture at all to 50% of the soil. And so blue corresponds to water. So wet soils would be shown in blue and dry soils would be shown in red here. This is Arizona. If you've ever visited Arizona or you've pictured, seen pictures of it, it's very dry at the surface. It seems very, very dry. And it is. This is, in fact, what we estimate with our radar. So uh, that's a check. And the interesting thing here is that as, as you dig through the surface, and we are digging with our radar, okay, so this is not actual digging, but it's like we're uh, looking at lower and lower layers through the ground, and you see that the moisture actually increases. Even though we're in Arizona, which is a desert, it's considered a desert, you see that if you go only 75 centimeters below the surface, you actually have quite a bit of water. And this is interesting. Again, we're talking about global water stores and uh, quantities of water, the water puzzle. Like we didn't know that we, uh, know this. I mean, you could dig in you know, small areas and get point estimates of how much water there is, but from a large perspective, from, from in a global perspective, this is the first time that uh, we have been able to show that there's actually quite a bit of water under the surface. And this is the kind of uh, product that we're hoping to generate globally if, if there were a satellite system. This is another example. This is in a location called Tanja Ranch in California, it's in Central California, similar story. So we have some soil moisture at the surface, and as you dig into the surface, you see more and more water. And of course, we have validated our observations with several uh, ground uh, in situ observations. So we get very good matches with our ground observations. This is just an example here. And uh, we've done this over a period of four years, over a thousand flight hours with this instrument, and this is how our estimated values compare with uh, measured values on the ground. So uh, quite a good, about 5% agreement with ground observation. So we're pretty confident. Uh, we've also taken this instrument to Alaska in, in the Arctic. I, I mentioned that the uh, permafrost in the Arctic is something that's really suffering from, um, uh, from the global climate change trends. It's, um, it is true, there's evidence that permafrost is degrading. Permafrost, by the way, is soil that remains frozen for uh, two years or more. Uh, Alaska has, especially northern Alaska, has a lot of soils that have permafrost underneath them. So we have taken this P-band radar instrument and flown uh, it on the airplane over the blue lines that you see here, uh, or the green lines that you see here, and we've generated maps of permafrost. And let me skip through this in the interest of time. This is an example of what we can um, get over permafrost. Uh, and we've flown this instrument over three year uh, period in Alaska, 2014, 15, and 17. Uh, the left panel shows soil moisture there, and the right panel is a quantity, which you see here as ALC, it stands for active layer thickness. It's basically the layer above permafrost that goes through freezing and thawing cycles. And if this layer deepens, it means that we are losing frozen soil. So we see that over period of three years, there are areas where the active layer actually has decreased, in some areas active layer has increased. So we need to be uh, observing this over uh, longer and longer periods of time over the different areas to be able to make a global or 
an assessment uh, on a large regional scale about what's happening to permafrost. But this is just an example. And, and then there's the question about groundwater. How do we um, uh, observe groundwater? Roots on soil moisture is one thing, or permafrost, we're talking about the top meter of the surface, but we need to go deeper and deeper. And uh, groundwater in many areas of the world is the source of uh, water consumption for, um, for sustaining the human population. Uh, we're working on that topic too. This is the chart from one of my uh, colleagues here at USC where they flew a low even lower frequency radar. So we're talking about uh, 40 or 50 megahertz radar on top of the helicopter. And you see that this is done in uh, this particular example is from uh, uh, from Kuwait. And you see that we can see the uh, the top of the, the aquifer, the groundwater table to about 60 or 70 meters below the ground. So uh, these are very experimental, um, uh, but that's definitely something that we are currently working on uh, and actually working on, which is related to that, uh, is developing uh, ground sensors, small in situ radars, which we can deploy over the surface. And they would allow us to see groundwater to uh, many, many meters below the surface. So um, this is just kind of a cartoon version of our system that we can deploy networks of these sensors so that we can map tomographically the, uh, the water table below uh, the surface. Uh, which uh, leads me to this uh, kind of one of my final charts, which is that we, we are extending uh, this the network of in situ sensors for groundwater to low flying airplanes, or in this case, uh, drones or UAVs, which uh, ultimately what we are uh, working on right now is to um, deploy our small uh, radar sensors on these uh, drones and fly them in formation and uh, produce maps of not just soil moisture, but also uh, groundwater table. So just to summarize, uh, I want to highlight that microwave remote sensing at especially lower frequencies. So we're talking about uh, about a gigahertz and lower uh, to penetrate to the surface. These are indispensable tools for characterizing uh, water resources at the surface and below. And uh, we can do soil moisture profile mapping, we can do permafrost active layer mapping, and more uh, recently we're working on groundwater uh, table mapping for aquifer detection. Uh, we do most of this using conventional backscatter radars, but um, more recently, and I didn't really have a chance to talk about this here, but we're also using signals of opportunity, uh, using GPS in particular. And uh, for the uh, you know, a new generation of investigators, uh, uh, you know, early career scholars, there are numerous outstanding problems here that, that could be uh, excellent research opportunities for you. Instrument development, whether it's airborne, spaceborne, or UAV-based sensors, many signal processing techniques that uh, still need to be developed, and also uh, computational modeling uh, in electromagnetics. So with that, I'm going to stop and uh, see if there are any questions. Okay, thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk. Uh, in fact, uh, the theme of the conference, Connect, is to see that uh, there are so many components of system building which are relevant uh, for solving uh, our real world problems. So I think uh, it's a perfect uh, uh, exposition of how we need to think about different technologies and techniques uh, to ensure that we solve, uh, build a system for solving our problem. Thank you very much again for a wonderful talk. My pleasure. Thank you so much. So may I request uh, Puneet to uh, look at the Q&A box? Or I could yes. do it myself. Yeah, yes. okay. No, no, no. I, I will do it, sir. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mata, for your wonderful talk and perspective. We are really honored to have you, and uh, we have learned a lot of things about uh, microwave remote sensing through you. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we are going to have our first question. Can you recommend some open source tool to monitor diffusion profile on a small scale or for stagnant water? Open source tools, you know, that's a tough one. Um, it's a, kind of a, a recent, let's call it, movement in the remote sensing community to um, to post code on platforms such as GitHub. Um, 
so that's where I would recommend that you look. I know that there are some open source tools through the European Space Agency, um, so you may search them. I can't unfortunately recommend anything in particular off the top of my head. Uh, I know that the GRS at IEEE Geoscience Remote Sensing Society has been working on a uh, remote sensing library to house some code as well. So yeah, those are the three things I would recommend. So look at the GRSS code library, GitHub or Bitbucket, and also European Space Agency. Thank you. Next question is, how does the vegetation and the type of vegetation affect the accuracy of these measurements on soil moisture? Uh, they could quite a bit. Uh, in fact, you could argue that you can use the same instruments to quantify vegetation on top of the surface because vegetation uh, definitely is, uh, I mean, depending on your uh, your objective vegetation could be your noise, could be a nuisance, or could be your information. Uh, either way, uh, you know, the higher you go in frequency, the more sensitive you, sensitive you are to vegetation. Uh, if, you, if you're at P-band, which is at 420 megahertz, you are less sensitive. Nevertheless, if you have a tall tree, uh, it will impact. So your electromagnetic models must include uh, contributions from the surface. Uh, in them. So again, think of it as a kind of a frequency dependent source of noise for your soil moisture signal. Next question is being asked from Dr. Sudhakar Rao of Northrop Grumman. He's asking Hello, how Sudhakar. accurately, <laughs> yeah, he's asking how accurately can you predict the subsurface water content and what parameters cause prediction errors? Uh, so, um, is uh, you uh, if you uh, I mean I was flying through the slides pretty fast, but one of the charts had the comparison between the retrieved soil moisture and uh, uh, and measured in situ soil moisture. The difference between them is on the average about 0.05 volumetric meter cube per meter cube of soil moisture. So five percent is what we can do. Now this is this starts at, at more accurate close to surface and becomes less and less accurate as you move down in the subsurface. So when we're looking at 10 or 20 centimeters, we get actually something like 4% accuracy. As you go down to 50 centimeters, it becomes about 6% accuracy. And you would expect that because the the accumulate, accumulated noise becomes more and more as you as the signal moves to the subsurface. Um, and then the second part of the question, was it with respect to vegetation or? Uh... Yeah, I will just read out what parameters cause prediction errors. Right, so uh, our estimate of vegetation is one thing uh, that if in, in our models, because there's so many unknowns, we have to pre-assign certain things in the computational domain. So oftentimes we actually uh, input what we know about vegetation into our model. That input is off, is wrong, that definitely causes a big error in the estimate of soil moisture. Another thing is that, and Dr. Rao notes, so being an expert in electromagnetics himself, is that the models themselves are often a source of error. So you know, we, we try to do as good a job as possible in constructing our computational domains, but still, you know, we can do only so much. Um, so that could be a source of error for sure. And finally, another thing is calibration of our systems. So the system I showed, the AirMOS system, the P-band, um, we have actually excellent calibration accuracy, which we have improved over the years. It's about uh, half a dB uh, polarimetric uh, calibration accuracy, but even that could cause uh, you know, some noticeable error in the final product. Yeah, thank you. We will go to the next question. Question is, what are the challenges for antenna size at megahertz frequencies? So definitely there are challenges. And um, if you're talking about a SAR system, uh, you might know that actually the antenna size for SAR system is, uh, it comes in two different uh, capacities. One is that when you synthesize your aperture in the long track direction, actually the smaller the antenna, the better your resolution. It's kind of counterintuitive, but that's just how uh, the concept of a synthetic aperture radar uh, works. 
so you, you gain you know, some advantage that way. Small antenna means better resolution. However, in any radar system, you have a minimum antenna area requirement because you need to push out a certain amount of signal out of your antenna area. And so that really becomes the bottleneck. And uh, that antenna size, minimum antenna size area definitely increases as you go to lower frequencies. So that's really the main challenge. On airborne platforms, the one I showed, the antenna size that we have, the, the long direction is about one and a half meters or so. So it's really not that bad. It's easily doable. As you go to air, uh, spaceborne platforms, we're talking about antenna sizes of 10 or 15 meters. So again, it becomes, it's not impossible to do it, but it becomes increasingly uh, an issue. Uh, if we go even lower, so if we go to tens of megahertz, then yes, definitely we're talking about tens of meters for the antennas, and you know, it becomes more and more difficult to do. Now that said, then there have been anten there have been systems that NASA has launched for um, uh, deep space applications or Mars type exploration, and those have been uh, monopole type antennas, very long, but those are simple antennas, and they can be uh, deployed easily as well. Yeah, I will be taking the last question now. What is the effect of environment moisture on ground moisture sensing? Environment moisture, you mean like in, in the air, or in the atmosphere? At these frequencies, not much at all. So P-band or L-band, they're really not impacted by atmospheric uh, uh, water vapor. It's only at much higher frequencies that you would get impacted. There is, if, if you're looking at phase, maybe at L-band, for example, you'll, you'll get some uh, atmospheric water vapor impact, but um, for the schemes that I showed, we're using the magnitude of backscatter signal. So um, very, very. Yeah, some two observations are being made. I will just read out. So first is being made by Dr. V. Mahadevan. He is uh, giving a feedback that polarization also is an important method in S band and S L band, and that is the most preferred option. Second feedback is some researchers and are also on, on working note, on optical. Uh, on that note, I was just going to make a comment about the the NASA system. Obviously, the NASA and the Indian Space Agency are working on. Yes, that we're, we're very much looking forward to that system. I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you. The next observation is being made by Krishna Prasad. He is telling that some researchers are also working on optical frequencies to extract soil moisture. Mm. Right, surface soil so moisture. So you want to right. give in? Yeah. Uh, right, there, there are, and the optical frequencies, you know, you can penetrate through the surface, so definitely uh, over the surface, and also there's much more uh, occlusion due to vegetation. So it's limited, but it's, I consider that to be a complementary observation source. Yeah, Professor Hari, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Puneet. Uh, I think uh, we need to thank all the speakers for a wonderful session because it sort of uh, brought together the power of uh, system design, I think, which is central to uh, what we do as engineers and the role of uh, engineering education, the role of software uh, tools, and then the power of uh, RF, EM theory, signal processing, and computing, and communication, I think, uh, basically uh, puts everything together. And I hope that the students and the faculty of uh, uh, various engineering colleges and the universities who are attending this uh, session would take home the importance of uh, trying to uh, think beyond what the textbook says and look at problems around us, which could be very, very local, and uh, you will not have someone else from some other region understand our local problems. And uh, pick up a problem, look at it from a scientific and engineering perspective, and uh, find solutions. And that is what IEEE uh, provides us a vehicle uh, for us to uh, go forward and realize our uh, thoughts and dreams. Uh, so I thank the organizers. I thank the speakers for a wonderful session. Uh, it was uh, uh, fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, thank you, Professor.
very much. Thank you, Dr. Mahata. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh, uh, Dr. Susha, uh, Mr. Shan, Kathy Land. And I can see still uh, Lance Fung is with us. Thank you, Dr. Lance Fung. And all invited speakers as well as keynote speakers, we are really honored and indebted to have you all with us that to in this late hours of India, in fact, it may be slightly better because it is a morning time for you. But you can see from morning 8.30 onwards, we are continuously on uh, WebEx mode with multiple sessions going on. And uh, then we have this inauguration in the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the delegates who are still with us. I can see more than 125 participants are still with us at this odd hour in India, which is 9 p.m., close to 9 p.m. So thank you very much. Tomorrow morning, again, 8.30, we will be starting with our keynote sessions. Do join us again. Have a good night and good all of you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.